so uh, hello everyone uh, so i hope you can uh, uh, hear me uh, so welcome back all uh, to this uh, first workshop on astronomical society of india meeting 2021 uh, on computational astrophysics uh, so we will start now uh, with session 3 uh, focused on uh, simulations of uh, galactic and extra galactic scales and uh, we have a very diverse uh, set of talks over here by four speakers uh, which range from Uh, star formation uh, triggered by magnetic fields to astrochemistry uh, to significance of mathematical models and the art of approximation uh, and then uh, on cosmological uh, radiative uh, transfer uh, simulations uh, so uh, today uh, the first speaker of this session is uh, professor ruby banerji uh, who joins us all the way from hamburg uh, so uh, a great uh, you know thank you ruby for joining us for, for from in this time uh, we would have been happy if you had been around physically uh, but uh, thankful for you know for these uh, strange times but we are still happy to hear you uh, on your recent uh, research uh, so roby as uh, some of you may not know so he is one of the main uh, developers of the flash code uh, for many years uh, now and he also maintains a diverse set of interests on molecular clouds and star formation radiative transfer uh, cosmic magnetic fields of course uh, many things uh, so i would give the uh, charge to uh, roby now uh, and uh, the title of his talk is uh, star formation uh, triggered by magnetic fields uh, so roby just to wait for one or two minutes uh, so that we can just start on time and uh, you have 20 minutes uh, for the talk and then 5 minutes for discussion session uh, so at the end of 18th minute i will just ping you on chat okay saying that you have two minutes left and things like that and uh, i encourage all the participants to write the questions either on zoom uh, or there is a slack channel uh, so please put it there on session 3 and we can take that up uh, as and when we get time uh, yeah so over to you uh, ruby uh, <clears throat> okay yeah thank you thanks for the invitation i totally agree i would love to be in in india <laughs> this time as well um yeah you know we have winter here right now and yes. uh, it 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 wouldn't hurt to get some some sun eventually um yeah thanks for the invitation and uh yeah give me a a, a hint when i should uh, start with the talk by the way i i'm not sure whether i can see the chat while i'm sharing my screen so um but I'm pretty sure if I at at the end of the session or uh, end of the talk, I will unshare the screen and I can I can have a look at it at the chat as well. So should I start, Sharon? Yes, Ruby, you can start now. Okay, then I I start. So yeah. Um, Yeah. I, again, thanks for the invitation. Uh, participating at this uh, workshop on computational astrophysics, and I will talk about um, star formation, uh, essentially triggered by magnetic fields, and will address um, an old issue, uh, which comes in the combination of star formation. If you talk about star formation and magnetic field, and the work is actually based on uh, a work. By a postdoc here in in Hamburg, Bastian Kurtgen. So he did the uh, important simulation, and of course, uh, I listed my co-workers on this particular work, uh, which is Ralph Podritz and Enrique uh, Vasquez and Wolfram, also here from the observatory in in Hamburg. Okay, uh, just to get you uh, essentially on online or um, on uh, addressing the the issue. So. The, the interstellar medium is um, essentially highly magnetized. Uh, what I mean with highly is that the magnetic energy density is actually comparable to the thermal energy. So this is uh, so expressed in in terms of the plasma beta is of of the order of one. So that tells you immediately that magnetic fields should have an an influence on any dynamics. On the in the interstellar medium, in particular, on star formation, and to get you a, a few numbers, of course, the uh, I don't know if you see my my cursor here. So 
we have uh, the, the typical magnetic fields are of the order of, of micro gauss a few micro gauss on a, on the large scale uh, magnetic field in, in galaxies and of course it, it scales with uh, density um, which i will address in a few minutes um, there are also some hints that uh, essentially magnetic fields are you know fairly fairly strong in the in the in terms of uh, that the alphane velocity can actually supersede the turbulence velocity, which is assumed to be supersonic. Uh, so that means that the ener energy density of magnetic field can actually exceed. Uh, Robin, uh, just to interrupt you, so we can't see changing your slides. Uh, you cannot see my slides? Yeah, we are, we are only seeing the first slide. Okay. Now? No. How come? Hmm. That is not good. <laughs> hmm. you now you see the. Yes, yes. Yes, that can is. <laughs> uh, do you have any idea how we can fix this? So, I, I of course, I want to, to play the slides. Right. Uh, I think instead of sharing a particular window, you can share the entire screen. Yeah. Maybe you uh, can try okay. that. So I stop sharing and try again. Um, desktop. Yeah, yeah, you can share the, first, the first option on top. Top okay, left. Okay, let's yeah. try this. And yes. then, okay. Yes. So is it better? Yeah. Yes, that's right. Okay, thanks. Thanks for your help. Uh, then continue there. Uh, so as I said, I was uh, talking about the strengths of magnetic field and the influence on the dynamics. And um, there are actually some hints like work by Hua Bai Li and Thomas Henning, which uh, is a, a few years old, um, indicating that magnetic fields so that the, even the energy density of magnetic field even supersedes the one of uh, the kinetic one, so the turbulent magnetic field, or in terms of the alphane velocity, that could be that the alphane velocity is larger than the turbulent velocity. Again, uh, that is a, essentially a hint that magnetic field should be dynamically important for uh, the interstellar medium. And uh, for our own Milky Way, I uh, just present uh, uh, this seminal work essentially going back 20 years, so the, which is called the um, Millennium uh, Arecibo um, Survey. The Arecibo telescope, unfortunately, is broken, as you might have heard. Um, and this work by uh, um, Heinz and Troland, for instance, they, they, again, they indicate a median magnetic field of the order of micro gauss, or of a few or six micro gauss. So that means the, the large scale magnetic field uh, in the Milky Way is, uh, is a, uh, as I said, so is of the order of about six micro gauss. And this work is based on um, essentially uh, the, the Seaman effect on the 21 centimeter line. So the neutral hydrogen, and, um, atomic neutral hydrogen. Um, yeah, here again, that's the uh, abstract of this work, uh, again, with a medium magnetic field of about six microgauss. Just to put this in, uh, in context. Um, yeah, I like this picture very much. So this is an, an observation by or then um, data reduction actually from the Planck survey, which is uh, of course aimed to uh, measure the fluctuation in the cosmic microwave background, but they had to do a, a really good work on foreground sources as well. And they have to deal with um, the contamination from their side on the coming from the galactic, from the, from the Milky Way. From my side is essentially, um, I would say that, you know, here we can see some very useful uh, results actually from coming from the Planck um, survey uh, instead of, you know, pinning down the cosmological parameters to a precision value. So this is, uh, gives you a little bit of a visual impression on the dynamic again on the, 
of magnetic field on the interstellar medium uh, by seeing this uh, stri uh, uh, striations here. So uh, where you can um, more or less see that the magnetic field is following, uh, sorry, that the gas is somehow following the magnetic field structure uh, in the galaxy. And if you zoom in a little bit uh, on, on molecular scale, what you find typically is that the magnetic field is, a, um, is essentially aligned perpendicular to the dense structures and uh, parallel to the low density structures, uh, which is analyzed uh, comparing numerical simulations by uh, Fabian Heitsch, for instance, with the uh, Planck polarization uh, data. And uh, this picture fits actually fairly well on the idea of uh, how uh, molecular clouds are forming somehow by streams of atomic gas, which are so low density gas following the, the field lines and eventually um, in the intersection regions, they get compressed uh, and uh, this is how we think you find the structures that the magnetic field in the dense region is essentially perpendicular to the elongation of these molecular clouds, the denser molecular gas. So that is again a dynamic impact of magnetic field by the formation of, um, of molecular clouds. And of course, if you zoom in, in denser regions, you find a stronger magnetic field. So here's for instance, um, uh, indication of the of the magnetic field strengths going back to the Chandrasekhar Fermi method of about a couple of hundred um, microgauss in uh, IRDC, so uh, very dense uh, regions where we think massive stars will form. Uh, here's another uh, example. So this is what a famous example of an IRDC in, in infrared dark cloud. Um, called the brick, so close to the galactic center. Uh, and here you, we find, of course, with higher densities, stronger magnetic fields, so in the, in the order of uh, milligauss even. And this is uh, uh, known for uh, many objects. So if you could zoom in or look at denser regions, the magnetic field also uh, the magnetic field strength also increases. And um, so this is again a compilation essentially uh, of uh, by, by um, Dick Crutcher of uh, on, the, on the one hand, uh, on, the, on the left hand side in this plot, the low density region, uh, you find this um, 21 centimeter analysis. So the H1 gas, the atomic gas, and on the denser regions here, you find the, um, the molecular uh, gas, so the, the dense uh, regions like uh, even bog globules and, and um, objects like this, so uh, dense molecular gas, which is supposed to form stars here. And this is just a line, so the, um, which is a, a kind of a fit to the, to the data. Um, of course, why, why we assume or why do we get um, a an, an correlation of the uh, magnetic field with the, with the underlying density is because of flux freezing. So the, um, the interstellar medium is fairly, fairly is a very good conductor. So even if the ionization degree is only of the order of 10 to the minus five or even lower, uh, this is still enough to couple the, the gas to the magnetic field. So the gas and the magnetic field are fairly well coupled and hence the flux, the magnetic flux is frozen into the plasma. And if you have a small, depending on the, on the geometry of the, of the magnetic field, if you have a, a tangled magnetic field, a, a small scale uh, magnetic field, so a, 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 so a magnetic field which is tangled or which uh, coherence length is smaller than the, the uh, clump size, for instance, then the magnetic field strength will increase with the density with the power of two thirds. So that's an, an essentially an entangled magnetic field. 
Um, and uh, again, the underlying uh, physical concept here is, is that the flux, the magnetic flux is frozen into the, the plasma. Um, and this is important in, in connection with uh, star formation. You have an, on the one hand, you have an, an conserved quantity. And uh, by the way, uh, I, yeah, the, the flux is also a conserved quantity. I, I didn't mention this, but this is of course important. Uh, the magnetic flux is a, in a, in a uh, plasma, which is well connected to the magnetic field. The flux is frozen, it is a constant. And uh, so is the mass, of course. The mass is also a, a constant in an uh, enclosed system or in, in, in a closed system. And uh, from these two quantities, you can essentially build um, a quantity which is called the mass to flux ratio. Again, this is a quantity which is conserved. Um, and then you can essentially, uh, with this conserved quantity, you can also rewrite this. So uh, if the, the mass to flux ratio is conserved, you find that the magnetic field uh, scales with the surface density of the gas. And of course, similar to a Jeans type argument, there is a critical value um, which you have to supersede. So a, a, cl a, a, ma a cloud has to have a larger mass, essentially a large enough mass to collapse. Um, and if it doesn't, uh, essentially the magnetic field will, will prevent the collapse of a cloud core. And the critical value is given in this quantities here. So it's about a tenth uh, in, in units of uh, one over square root of the gravitational constant. And depending a little bit, so the, pre, the, the, uh, the prefactor is depending on the, on the geometry of the magnetic field. Okay, um, so now, oh, now let me go. Now we can essentially convert uh, Dick Rutgers, um compilation of, of the data points into a plot where we show the magnetic field uh, as a function of the surface density of uh, the gas. And uh, because then we can also put in this critical value for the, for the magnetic field or the, the uh, mass to flux ratio in this plot and um, divide essentially regions which are subcritical. So all these data points you see here on the left-hand side above the criticality line, they cannot collapse. So they cannot collapse because gravity or its mass is not sufficient. Um, and if you compress the gas, um, the only thing you can do is essentially walk parallel lines to this uh, supercriticality uh, line here. So, but you cannot, because this would violate this uh, mass uh, mass to flux ratio, this constant mass to flux ratio, you cannot move this data points from left to right, for instance. You cannot cross uh, this line. So in, in principle, if we go back to this idea that uh, our um, uh, gas, the H1 gas is the, you know, pre are the precursors for the, for the molecular gas, then we have to ask the question, and if we bring in the H1 gas, to form collapsing molecular structures, then we have to ask the question, how do we get these data points essentially over here in the, in the supercritical regions? Otherwise we wouldn't form stars. Um, yeah, and we did, we sent out and, and, and did a couple of simulations, a uh, very idealized simulation of so-called colliding flows. Um, where you can put some numbers and in particular, um, the, <clears throat> uh, you, you find regions if they are long enough, if you have enough gas essentially on the, on the kiloparsec scales, uh, so about a kiloparsec, then these gas, these coherent gas flows of H1 gas, that is supercritical. And if you look at smaller regions, they are essentially not. Um, 
And this is an idea essentially to bring in enough gas on kiloparsec scale. That is an idea going back to Leon Messel, uh, who was of course working even in the 50s with, with Spitzer on, the, on this um, mass to flux ratio. And he was wondering how we can essentially form stars in magnetized, out of the magnetized medium. And um, he was first working essentially on, uh, on ideas of ambipolar diffusion, but he uh, realized that ambipolar diffusion, so essentially on um, somehow in, in, in a moving flow, in a neutron moving flow, that you reduce the, the flux um, of, the, of the magnetic field because uh, the neutral gas is of course not coupled to the magnetic field. And, um, but he himself, so Leon Messel, realized that is not efficient enough. So ambipolar diffusion is essentially not uh, sufficient enough or not efficient enough to accumulate supercritical cloud cores. And there's a couple of other uh, ideas on, on connected to turbulence or uh, reconnection. So uh, changing the, essentially the geometry of the uh, field lines. So I will show you um, some movies here on this colliding flow simulation. Unfortunately, they don't work quite well. Where you see on the left-hand side, a supercritical configuration, we form stars. And on the right-hand side, it's barely um, subcritical. And hence we see only a few stars or so essentially more or less fully suppressed star formation. And we also uh, did simulation with ambipolar diffusion. Uh, again, on the, on the left-hand side, you see ideal. So uh, the ideal case where uh, star formation is uh, suppressed um, or there's only very few regions essentially due to uh, a little bit of ambipolar diffusion or a little bit of numerical diffusion in this case. And on the right-hand side, here you see the, the result essentially. Uh, you see simulation with ambipolar diffusion and it that doesn't help as essentially Mestel already uh, pointed out that is not sufficient to form supercritical uh, cloud cores. Um, Ruby, you have two more minutes. Uh... Two more minutes. Okay, then we have to jump to the simulation, uh, to the solution. You know, how do we get stars out of the magnetized uh, interstellar medium. And then Bastian set out essentially to do global simulation, global galactic simulations to see whether Messel's accumulation idea uh, works. And uh, indeed, uh, this uh, animation work a bit better. I think what you see is that we form, so this is a fairly strongly magnetized um, uh, region or uh, magnetized gal uh, galaxy, this galaxy. And nevertheless, we do form uh, high density clumps which are supercritical and can form uh, stars. And you see here uh, these little bubble up um, regions, and these are due to uh, uh, here's a comparison uh, again of the non-magnetized and magnetized case. And even in the strongly magnetized case, again, we find supercritical cloud cores. And the reason is uh, going back again to a very old idea by uh, Parker, by Richard Parker, um, uh, on the Parker instability. So this is essentially buoyant uh, magnetic field, which gas flows along the, the field lines and accumulates essentially in the in the disk in the in the in the mid plane of the disk and these accumulation regions are indeed larger than these critical regions of about um, an, an kiloparsec so we can with the parker instability we can accumulate gas along um, fairly large regions of the order of kiloparsec and hence uh, form um, form a supercritical uh, cloud core. So this is my, my last slide here. And plus there's of course a, a, a variety of um, mass to flux ratios in these cloud cores, but um, most of them are, or the, 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 the giant molecular clouds, the GMCs are indeed all supercritical 
and can easily form stars. And the gas, which is uh, essentially, uh, which forms these, these cloud cores come from large accumulation regions. And we don't need any uh, uh, flux loss. So there's no need of magnetic flux loss to form this supercritical cloud cores and to form stars. Okay, then uh, this is my message and I thank you for listening. And of course, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, questions. Yeah, thank you, Ruby, for a nice talk. Uh, so I invite questions uh, from the uh, participants. Uh, so already Bhargav has one question. Uh, so let me just ask you to unmute. Bhargav, can you go ahead? Yeah, hi, Robbie. A very, very nice talk and a very interesting and a, uh, at the same time, a little bit of... Uh, um, th there is a lot of discussion since uh, uh, 80s about how these stars form. I have just one... So oh, I can't hear you. So Bhargav seems to be frozen. <laughs> yes, even though there is no snow in his... <laughs> Bhargav? Oh, unfortunately, I didn't get his question. Maybe you can come back to him later. Yeah, yeah. I think the next question is by Kandu. Uh, so, Kandu, I'm unmuting you. Yes, uh, Thanks, Ravi. Nice to see you and hear you. Yeah. <laughs> I can't see you, but nice to hear you, Kandu. Oh, okay, I can. Uh, I don't think I can start the video. But my question is following. This Parker instability is great, but it requires a large-scale magnetic field to be there in the disk. But when you first form the disk, it takes some time for the large-scale magnetic field probably to build up if it's a dynamo. But one thing, stars have already started forming in, uh, in high redshift let's say disk galaxies, that is people don't know, but they assume that it forms. So do yes. you have any idea without the magnetic field? Yeah, I, yeah, that's a little bit, uh, you're right, that it's a chicken and egg uh, uh, question. And so my, you know, five cent answer to this would be that um, uh, indeed early galaxies, so the first galaxies, uh, first stars form more in an environment with a is a weaker magnetic field where we don't have this issue of, you know, an, an, an supercritical and, and subcritical mass to flux ratio. And then only later with the galactic dynamo, essentially, we build up a large scale magnetic field of the order of, say, uh, six micro gauss. Um, so that indeed, I would assume that stars are already there forming in a, in a lower magnetized medium. And then due to the uh, galactic rotation, we get a fairly, well, the magnetic field is essentially amplified to this values we, we observe today. And also we find then that would also explain then the large scale structure of the magnetic field as for instance, observed by, by Heiss and Troland and also other galaxies like um, M51, I think is a prime example where we think there's a, a large scale component of the magnetic field. And I think that comes due to the uh, rotation of the, of the disk, the galactic disk. Right, so you're saying you don't require the magnetic field to form the stars. In fact, it hinders it at some level. Yeah, I mean, exactly. So uh, if you once observe a strongly magnetized ISM, of course, then you have to scratch your head and ask yourself, hmm, how can stars form, uh, overcoming essentially the, this uh, condition of or becoming supercritical, uh, but only then. Um, and before, uh, in the so did the first first galaxies and first stars form most probably in an environment which is not as strongly magnetized. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Uh, before I get to the next question by Dibendu, uh, there is a question here from I think a student, uh, Somo Gupta. Uh, so, Robi, he asks, uh, can you please elaborate a bit about the difference between the subcritical and supercritical star formation? Um, going back to the... So, the idea, there is, essentially, the idea is in a, in a 
uh, subcritical region, uh, there is no star formation because it is very similar to the uh, Kleene's argument. You need, an, you know, you have to overcome the Kleene's mass, the critical mass of a cloud core to collapse. Uh, otherwise, it would not collapse. And the, the same argument holds here. Uh, if your cloud mass is too small compared, essentially, if you like, to the uh, magnetic pressure, or, uh, then you cannot collapse this cloud core. That, that this cloud core does not collapse uh, due to self gravity. So that's the, yeah. the underlying idea. And you can hear, because it has such a nice scaling with the surface density in a plot like this, you can then put a division line here and uh, find all the, the gas, which is subcritical. And uh, on, the, on the left-hand side or below this line, below the blue line and all the gas and clump cores, uh, 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 sorry, above this critical line. This is uh, stuff which doesn't collapse and uh, below this line, that, that stuff that can collapse due to uh, self-gravity. And uh, again, the, the idea is here that it is that initially we think that our molecular clouds are formed out of this uh, dilute H1 gas. So we have to somehow move these points over there. And if the picture is right, which we, which we think that the Parker instability does the job, these points essentially never lived here. So they're all below this line. And what is, the, what is not caught is essentially the full uh, length of this H1 cloud. So we, we pierce essentially through the H1 gas. We, we are not catching the full um, surface density, the, not the full column density of these H1 clouds, but only parts of it because they might be bent uh, along the the line of sight, for instance. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, so there's one last question I want to pick up uh, by Dipendu. Uh, so Dipendu, please uh, go ahead. Uh, yes. Yeah, hi, Roby. So this is not my field, but I'm just curious. Um, so once the star formation process starts, uh, that in itself, the associated flows in itself could actually disrupt uh, the, the pre-existing magnetic fields with which uh, it was sort of interacting. Um, that could influence the subsequent process as well. So does it depend on the density of the gas from which star formation is starting and the initial strength of the magnetic field, how the interface sort of plays out? I mean, we, we, we know that, you know, magnetic field also play a role in uh, when, when the cloud core collapses and forms stars. We see outflows, for instance, jets, um, mm -hmm. or herbic harrow objects. These are a magnetically driven outflows. So they do have an impact on the, on the subsequent dynamics, of course. Uh, but the important thing is to start the collapse. Again, uh, the cloud core has to be super critical. Otherwise, it cannot collapse. I don't know if this fully answers your question. I didn't most probably. I mean, I sort of. I mean, yeah. <laughs> All right. We, we can continue in Slack, maybe. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. yes. Uh, uh, so, Roby, thanks again uh, for this talk. And uh, there are a few more questions which I have urged the, the, the participants to put it on the Slack channel. So maybe we will come to that at the end of this uh, session. Uh, so please remain with us, and uh, hopefully we'll have more time there to discuss uh, these interesting things. Uh, so now we uh, go on to the next speaker, uh, Kinshuk. Uh, thanks thanks uh, again. Uh, Goodbye. Yes, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Kinshuk Acharya, who joins us from the Physical Research Laboratory in Ahmedabad. And, uh, uh, the title of his talk is The Universe as a Giant Laboratory, uh, The Making of Complex Molecules from Atoms. I think it's a very interesting area of astrochemistry, which uh, all of us tend to ignore. So, Kinshuk, please go ahead. Yes, so you give me more times. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I really thank organizers, especially Vargab, Dipanjan, and Sarano, to uh, uh, give me an opportunity to speak about astrochemistry in this forum. So probably you can hear me fine, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, basically, let me first start with a, some sort of a disclaimer that complex molecules, uh, by complex molecules, I mean, like molecules having five, six atoms or more. In some cases, molecules like even uh, water can, I, I can consider it as a complex considering the unforgiving 
environments in which they are found okay so generally i will not target to explain any specific result instead i will, i keep this talk somewhat general and i will give some sort of in terms of some examples so let me start with some perspective so i think this is a favorite uh, 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 image for all physicists so i am not interested in the lower part i only want to point out three events like initial big bang nucleosynthesis by which we got our uh, light elements like hydrogen helium and then the time when we start to form clusters and galaxies and that is the time uh, after which we start to rather after the death of these stars we start to get other heavier elements like oxygen nitrogen carbon etc and finally another time scale so around say uh, about 3 billion years when actually star formation peak so that is the time actually after that uh, we expect to uh, get large amount of heavier elements like oxygen uh, nitrogen carbon etc in the uh, in the universe so that we can make bigger molecules also that that is that that is our starting point so let me now so the periodic table this is a very interesting in the sense that it, this periodic table shows actually the various processes by which these elements are formed so i will not bother you uh, generally astronomers periodic table is much shorter uh, my is even shorter so i will only show like carbon hydrogen nitrogen oxygen phosphorus sulfur which make up most biological molecules on earth so only thing i want you to uh, express is that so you you get h very quickly but after that you get hydrogen uh, rather oxygen uh, oxygen from uh, these uh, exploding stars okay so if you just look at now if you think about it so you will get oxygen much the large amount of oxygen much earlier than carbon and nitrogen because this carbon and nitrogen they are actually formed in the environment in the dying low mass stars at least bulk of them they form so and the low mass stars have large lifetime so as a result so if we go back in time we expect other than hydrogen more oxygen than carbon and nitrogen so therefore probably it is uh, very apt that probably we start to form molecules like water pretty early and this is our present uh, uh, solar system abundances in solar photosphere you can see here even here you have more oxygen than than carbon so now let me start with then water so this is uh, actually the earliest evident uh, probably one of the earliest evident where water is detected in a galaxy which is like 11 billion years old so water is pretty simple in that sense if you look at the star forming region so this is the aurora nebula and you can see dew of complex molecules so once again the complex means not so complex in terms of origin of life molecules but it is still pretty complex so not only that if you look at the star forming region close to the galactic center the sagittarius b2 which is only 130 parsec away from the center of the milky way you see host of complex molecules probably even including amino acids so not only that uh, the these molecules are found in exotic astrophysical conditions like envelope of agb stars agn disks even starburst galaxies not only that so if we just go about the exoplanets so i'm sure you have already uh, already know that you start to start finding molecules there as well and if you look at the uh, the physic the uh, diversity in the physical conditions it is quite uh, evident that you will very soon we will start to detect many more complex molecules probably some day biosignatures not only that these molecules are found widespread in the solar system uh, like earth mars their at atmospheres comets like even in the now you can see from the rosetta measurements you find that lot of organics are found in the comet not only that they are also found in meteorites so in meteorites these complexity is actually it, it's really very complex you see all sorts of complex molecules there so in reality the chemical evolution is kind of a from a non-living system to 
uh, the living system, it is a, like a continuous process. And you start with initial very diffuse interstellar medium. Generally, you go to a little bit denser medium, like dense clouds, then uh, protoplanetary disk, comets, asteroids, and then you come to the planetary systems like Earth, where you see organized structures. So this is kind of a continuous process. So therefore, it is very important in terms of like origin of life problem, but these molecules also gives very important, uh, like they are actually, uh, you can actually probe the physical conditions in these regions where they are found. So therefore, the study of these molecules are of uh, paramount importance. So I will mainly concentrate only this part, like uh, interstellar medium, then start forming regions a little bit, and then the comets. So now let me, uh, uh, I think by now I have convinced you that uh, the study of these molecules are very important. So now let me start how they are formed. So main ingredients are, so as I have said, you have, you know, this is, there are gas, but there is also dust. So the dusts are actually very important ingredient in this scheme of things, which you will realize in upcoming slides. So then I, I, will, I will also have like energetic radiation, like UV, cosmic rays and things like that. And molecules are formed both in the gas phase and also on the surface of the dust phase. Now let us take an interstellar medium. So if you come into the diffuse medium, which is like very uh, low dense, like one particle or even less per cubic centimeter, if you go into the denser region, it is like few thousand. And uh, in the outer edge, you get stellar radiation from various stars. And in the deep inside the cloud, you get radiation from the, the newborn star. So now, if you just think about generally in a, where the stars are formed, it is in the dense clouds, which is like 10 Kelvin. So now in this environment, all the elements are like moving randomly. So let us consider the hydrogen, which is the most abundant species. So now at some point of time, even it is 10 Kelvin, it has a thermal velocity, it will move around and it will uh, actually, at some, of, some point of time, it will collide. And if you look at a density, like when you have like one per cubic centimeter, the typical time scales is like 15,000 years or so. Now you replace one hydrogen by say one oxygen and this time scale becomes a million years. So typically to molecules to form, we need somewhat denser medium like few hundred to thousand per cubic centimeter. So, and of course, since these regions are very cold, we only can form some reactions which are important are the exothermic reactions that you don't need heat to produce them. And also we don't want reactions having any barriers because there is not much energy to overcome that barrier. And these molecules actually, uh, these, these processes actually not only form, they can also destroy molecules and uh, the UV rays and the cosmic rays, they can also destroy molecules. They can also in turn, they can uh, create various ions to form them. So now let us go to the dust grains. So dust grains are actually very important because its importance was first realized when people found uh, molecular hydrogen in the diffuse interstellar medium. So uh, the density is very low and you cannot just add two hydrogen atom to form H2 because uh, you need uh, extra agent to get, take away the extra energy. So you need a three body kind of reaction. But since density is very low, you can't get a three body reaction. So people invoked the grain surface, actually grains, which actually much less in number, but by mass it is like 1%. And they vary in size. So people successfully explained formation of H2 on the surface of the dust grains. So if you just see that what is the typical time scale of uh, uh, landing, uh, the, uh, accreting these atoms to the grain surface, if it's a little bit in a denser region, like I take a region like 10 to 4 per centimeter cube, which is about 100 years. So now once they're on the surface, they will move around randomly, unless whenever they found something, they will, uh, they will, uh, they will form a molecule or things like that. But now look at the time scales. So typical diffusion time scale is for hydrogen, at least it is less than a second. And then you can actually find out this. I will not go into the detail of the how you calculate rates and things like that. Basically, you sum of diffusion rates for from the each individual species, and then you uh, it is proportionally, of course, the number of species there, and of, of course the direction probability. But you have to keep uh, bring them out of the grain surface uh, uh, to uh, find them in the gas phase. So basically, you do 
via various type of desorption mechanism that is when the star formation starts you can get uh, the, you can uh, molecules can dissolve thermally from the surfaces and actually their time scales are also very different so if you think about hydrogen it is about say 500 seconds for any bigger species at 10 kelvin it is like significantly large amount of time so basically you cannot bring them out unless you hit them hit them there just i want to to note all these time scales so we started with some million years time scale then few hundred so one process has million years one process has few hundred years some processes when sub second so this is a recipe for a, a problem if you want to solve them numerically so this is what you solve actually so this is actually uh, the uh, in terms of chemistry so if you want to solve the time evolution of a chemical species uh, you, you you solve these different cell equations so basically these are formation terms these are dest uh, destruction pathways and uh, these two terms are actually uh, the interaction between gas and dust so in uh, when you are considering gas phase species these signs will be negative and positive if you consider dust grains the signs will be the reversed so as I have said, uh, said that the time scales are very different. So as a result, to solve them, you have to actually have special uh, uh, special techniques. So basically, this slide is intended to for students only. So if you just take a simple equation, so basically uh, the rate constant will give you time step. And if you just solve, take any process like Euler's forward method or Adams Moulton, which actually solves steep differential equation, you will get a very nice kind of a solution. But if you just add another term in this, say a reverse reaction, which is like four order of magnitude uh, faster. So now you have two different time scales to deal with, and you will find most of the uh, 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 standard integration methods will, uh, will, will break down. And basically, you need to invoke like gear method or Rosenberg methods to solve them. Actually, this slide credit goes to my student, Vikas Sony. So this is what is very important. So now think uh, think about that typically in a chemical network we have like thousand species that means we have these thousand different cell equations to evolve and you can see their time scale problems so as a graduate student you like work two years three years to develop a code first results you get random numbers uh, what your computer can print very lowest number to a uh, high number because your time scales uh, time steps are not correct so that is where your problem comes. Actually, you end up sp easily spend a few months to correct your uh, time step problem. So now you get the reaction cross sections from various databases. And uh, if you want to study isotopic things, uh, as probably many of you know, that for example, in many of the star forming regions, say you want to compare ratio between water and HDO. And they generally do not follow the cosmic abundance ratio. Generally, many many cases we found the uh, the rare isotopic species are significantly enriched. So, if you want to add isotopes in the system, so number of equations to solve is even more. So, of course, one good thing is that your association with the chemistry is only downloading cross sections from database and use them. And this is what is a good thing for a physicist. And the major complexity comes from the physical system. So remainder of the time, I will just discuss that only. So I will just now give some examples and I will try to tell you that how the physical systems actually decides how to go about, the, how to solve the problems. As far as chemistry is concerned, we are, we use some version of the network considering the, which, what, what molecules you want to study, what system you are studying, but end of the day, you solve steep differential equations. But in terms of physical system, that is the, the, uh, the physical parameters like temperature, pressure, density, all those has to come from the physical equations. So let me start with one example. The first example I will show is about star forming region. So now if you look at a star forming region, you will find the large variation in actually at least temperature and density you can see. So you start with diffuse clouds, uh, which is very low density, have uh, UV radiation, then you go to the dense cloud, which is only 10 Kelvin, and it is shielded from uh, all the radiation except cosmic ray, then you have a uh, very exotic class of objects, which we call hot core, which actually this is the object where we get more com most complex species in the um, in the star forming phases. And then of course you can also model protoplanetary disk. So I will start with the dense clouds because these are the easiest objects to simulate. So basically these are basically almost kind of physical conditions are almost static. So you start with some temperature like dust and grain temperature about 10 Kelvin and with a large visual extinction, so there is no UV, and there is only cosmic ray, and these are 
the elemental abundances. So except hydrogen, which actually comes in the H2, because in the dense clouds, almost all H is in the form of H2, and other elements, you mostly take them in the ionic form. Of course, there could be a small variation in that also. So now if you add the, all these uh, constraints, physical constraints in your system, and you solve this thousand uh, 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 steep differential equation, you get an output like this. So this is actually in x-axis, you see time, and in y-axis, relative abundance. So relative abundance, any abundance we will express in terms of total hydrogen. So this is how the time variation of various species uh, can can be look like. So we can see that uh, they will uh, their formation uh, peak formation time scales are different. Uh, actually, they will form in the different time scales. So you get an output. Then what you do? Actually, you try to compare them with the observation. So this I no need to uh, look at this table in detail, but look at the only the the bold numbers. So they are actually uh, those numbers are not ma matching actually. So that is you are not able to match with the observation. So but you can see you will agree that for most species you can uh, match with the observations reasonably well. Of course, after that you actually also try to fit uh, see that how good your uh, fit is. So you uh, test a goodness uh, uh, factor and you see that uh, like around 10 to the power five years you can match best. This is the collective matching of all uh, species that you observe. So now let me come to the diffuse clouds. So there, uh, 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 in some sense, they're very difficult in the sense that your density is very low. And if your density is low, then you cannot use any rate equation approach. So as of now in dense clouds, I was using like average values. Because say you have four grains and two hydrogen atoms. On an average, you have like 0.5 hydrogen atoms per grain, grain, but you cannot form anything because they are not physically on the same grain. So what do you do? So you actually do either Monte Carlo method or master equation approach. Basically, you deal all the processes probabilistically. So in addition to this, we also have stellar UV to deal with. So for example, so whenever a stellar radiation comes and fall on a grain surface, so you see that there are various sizes of grains. And this is basically uh, kind of a stochastic heating of the grain. So we can see that different grain size will have different temperature. And actually you see these spikes in, uh, as soon as a photon hits this grain, depending upon their size, you see a spike in temperature. So that you have to incorporate in the, your physical system. And it is uh, extremely challenging. Actually, some of these codes takes actually months to run because uh, your time scale for hydrogen diffusion is very fast, but all the other processes are are slow and also random, and also your time scale for star formation is also very large. So what you do, you actually do a, a Monte Carlo kind of technique. So basically, you uh, you uh, uh, consider a square lattice and with a periodic boundary condition. So this is uh, my hydrogen atoms, like these reds. I will move randomly with a periodic boundary condition. You will see they will come and come here. And if you are following any particular H, they, they may not form H2 because they are moving randomly. Just look at the center of the screen here. So I saved some favorable uh, things. So you will see that uh, this in the center part here actually in some this region. So you will form some, some H2. So this is this molecules, uh, these atoms moves randomly. And when they recombine, they form a species. It so should now be a few more minutes, OK? I uh, just wanted to tell you. Ah, OK. So I have to move really quickly. So yeah. just I will. So basically, if you. Just see this, uh, uh, any other formation of other species like water or so, you will see that most uh, species are almost uh, not mobile and only hydrogen is moving. OK, so let me just now move to the other class of objects like protoplanetary disks, where you see a, a variation of the physical conditions very differently. So basically, in the mid plane, you get something. In the outer region, you get a different kind of phys physical condition. So basically, you have to keep them, bring them uh, those information in the system. So what you get, actually, you form, uh, you, you take a, you run a hydrodynamic equation uh, model, or you also or take from the observations. And then you see that how your uh, abundance are evolving. So just this is as a function of radial distance. So you can see, just follow the blue one, which is water. So you can see when you come close to the central object, they will actually evaporate and you will find them in the gas phase. So let me have to move very quickly. Uh, and now uh, this, this slide actually shows that you form water much more efficiently on the ice uh, than the gas phase. So now 
Another aspect that we are missing so far is that star forming regions are also in other galaxies, which have like different metallicity. So like here I have shown like LMC and SMC, which is a factor of two to five less metal abundance. And if you see, look, uh, look at these regions, you see they follow the metallicity scale. But if you look at the gas phase here, they are almost similar value. So actually metallicity effect is very complex and you just add the different starting temperature of the grains, it becomes even complex. So I will not go into those things. So finally, I will just give one quick example for the, uh, the environment, the cometary atmosphere. So cometary atmosphere is once again very different. So here, uh, a, a cometary nucleus starts start to sublimate when it comes to the inner solar system. So basically, uh, the gases are expanding in the vacuum. So you have to consider all sorts of uh, uh, conservation equations, and then you can uh, integrate it and uh, you get outputs like this. But we have to consider, remember that uh, this, all the fluids move at different temperatures, like ions, neutrals, and electrons, they move, uh, they are having different temperature, which is very important for the, the chemical evolution. And this is the final slide. So this is one example for ex exoplanets. In the exoplanets, actually, what you do, you divide the atmosphere. Here, you, you consider like transport, photochemistry, then scattering and absorption of various species, and you bring them uh, on in your system. You still solve the same differential equations in some of chemistry, but the physical conditions are very different, and you add them in your system, and you, you get output like this. So I will not have time to discuss any of these things. So many of these slides are uh, from my students. And I finally, I will conclude uh, that uh, molecules are found in diverse astrophysical conditions. And uh, you can uh, you have to consider both the gas phase and the uh, dust grains to form them efficiently. And you have to use phys correct physical conditions to study them. And uh, uh, numerical models are reasonably a successful explaining observations. And in future, basically, at present, the use of hydrodynamics is very limited. At least we do not use many complex hydrodynamics model. And in terms of chemistry, we also have to go a long way uh, towards building uh, complex uh, molecules of life. And then, of course, at some point, of also we have to study like biosignatures in the exoplanet atmosphere. So I will now take questions. And once again, I will. Uh, yeah, thank, you. thank you, Kinshut, for providing us with a very broad uh, mm -hmm. overview in very different settings, astrophysical uh, settings. Uh, so I have a question from uh, Dipanjan. Uh, so I'm just, uh, yeah, so please go ahead, Dipanjan. Uh, I should, uh, I, I'll take the privilege to ask the first question before others raise hand. So very interesting talk and very interesting work as well. So uh, thank you for speaking about that. Now with the advent of millimeter astronomy, now with ALMA and IRAM and others, we have a vast amount of data that's coming in, showing wherever there's CO10 maps everywhere. But it's very difficult to interpret now how the molecules are formed in different diverse environments. Uh, and so uh, an effort like yours, where it actually calculates uh, the formation of molecules at different environments is very important. I had one specific question, and this is related to something that is more pertinent to my field. So I work on extragalactic jets, how they affect the dense multi-phase gas and the molecular content yes. of those gas. Yes. Well, now, in your, uh, in, in your course right now, the rates are fixed at a fixed temperature. Is, is, is that right in my understanding? Yes, it is a function of temperature. Yes. Okay, so do you vary? So can you have a grid of temperatures and you can vary the temperature and see the rates? Yes, it's very well. Uh, you can vary. So, but let me answer this in a little bit different way. Mm -hmm. So the temperatures is a, the single most important parameter, I would say. So depending upon the temperatures, what temperatures you are using, so actually, we can vary from say 10 Kelvin to 800 Kelvin in one single code. But if you want to go like few thousands that is easily used in the exoplanet atmosphere. So you have to take a different network. So it depends which molecules you want to study, which physical conditions you want to target. Say, for example, if you go to the higher temperature, the reverse reaction becomes very important. So that, that also you have to count, which doesn't occur very easily at 10 Kelvin. Well, so I had a question those, for uh, temperatures of a few thousand, but I think I'm uh, going beyond the time, so I'll write to you separately later. Yeah, but up to at least 1,000, 2,000 can be manageable. Okay. That, that much, because we also have to have these rates from the laboratory measurements. So that is the major bottleneck. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you, can play, you can continue your discussion on the Slack channel. Uh, so I don't see any more hands being raised. Uh, so I think I thank Kinshuk once again. And uh, now uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, Jasjit Bagla. 
and he will be joining us from the Indian Institute of Science Education and Research in Mohali. And uh, he, as uh, many of us would know, has a wide experience in developing codes, uh, 3PM codes, uh, gravitational clustering, in-body simulations, and dark energy. Uh, so, Jasjit, uh, over to you. Uh, so, please go ahead. Thank you, Sharanya. Uh, you can see my slide and you can hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, excellent. So, uh, I will talk a little bit about my work and uh, try to get a couple of uh, general messages across as well. Uh, so, much of my work has been on cosmological and body simulations where the uh, physical setting is that we have an expanding universe and uh, there is small amplitude of initial fluctuations, which means that you can easily start with the uh, analytically expressible uh, initial conditions from linear perturbation theory. Uh, then there is a Newtonian limit of the uh, Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker metric. Uh, we deal mostly with non-relativistic matter and uh, gravity as the most dominant interaction. Of course, there are variations around this. For example, if someone wants to deal with the neutrinos, they have to work on it separately. And there are many, many different techniques which have been developed. But I will be con uh, considering mostly these things in the first part of my talk. So the earliest attempts which people made, which was about uh, uh, almost 50 years ago, was to try and simulate isolated regions with open boundary conditions. Uh, taking, of course, uh, uh, recourse to Birkhoff theorem saying that if I have a homogeneous and isotropic universe and I create a shell inside that, then the outs anything outside of that uh, spherical shell does not influence it in any way. And therefore, I can just simulate this part. Uh, the downside is that if you do that, uh, you have to discard things which are very close to the boundary. And uh, as you all know, much of the volume is actually near the boundary and therefore you will end up wasting a lot of uh, your resources. The equations which one has to solve are essentially uh, uh, the gravitation interaction and uh, typically people work in co-moving coordinates and the expansion of the background comes in. An interaction is purely gravitational. One can either compute it as a sum of forces uh, uh, due to all the other particles or via gravitational potential. Direct summation scales as uh, order n square, and that makes running simulations with large n kind of difficult, although a lot of effort had been put in into uh, using FPGAs uh, in, in uh, 19, late 1980s and uh, 1990s on this one. Uh, periodic and, and that effort kind of continues and has been scaled up to fairly, fairly uh, large particle numbers. But if we take generic computers or uh, GPU based computers, then uh, the direct summation approach has not been used for at least not for cosmological and body simulations. Periodic boundary conditions are required as the universe has an average density and this cannot be emulated in open boundary conditions without wasting data near the boundary. So the equations are basically the ones which are written over here. Uh, one will, of course, need something additional because uh, one has to connect up uh, particle positions which are given by a vector x. I have uh, omitted the subscript i, which will run over all the particles, and the density contrast delta. So there has to be a connect over there, but that can be set up quite easily. It is set up differently in different codes, and that is why I have not uh, written that part here. The first serious approach for cosmological and body simulations was made by R.H. Miller uh, in this uh, paper back in 1983. Uh, th these were simulations with 64 cube particles. You can, of course, run these simulations on your phone now with lots of memory to spare. But at that stage, this was the kind of cutting edge which, which was possible. Uh, and he uh, did quantitative study of power spectrum correlations and uh, velocity statistics for a variety of models. Uh, keep in mind that uh, we are talking about 1983, where it was not clear what kind of initial conditions one should use. So people used all uh, a wide variety of uh, initial conditions. We also didn't know what kind of a universe we live in. And uh, Einstein de Sitter was a generic simple default, uh, which everyone uh, tended to use for most of these studies. So this was the first study and he got some fairly interesting results. Uh, this was quickly followed up by other people. 
Uh, now, the particle mesh method uh, per se is adapted from uh, plasma physics simulations, where it actually works much better than it does in gravitation because uh, you don't have an instability. Uh, you have device shielding and therefore densities don't build up as much in plasma non-relativistic uh, non plasmas as they do in gravity. Uh, gravitational potential and density in this case is computed on a mesh and the mapping between particle positions and uh, mesh uh, is done using weight functions like uh, cloud in cell. It's very fast when uh, fast Fourier transforms are used but uh, the downside is that use of a mesh limits force resolution and uh, mesh and uh, weight functions also end up introducing an isotropies in force. So this is illustrated in this plot on the right, which is from one of my papers uh, going back about 24, 25 years. So what is plotted on the top is the uh, RMS uh, dispersion in the radial component of the force uh, as a function of R units over here are uh, basically the grid length so one refers to grid length i have not plotted the average deviation here that is easily modeled out but uh, one can see that and, and this is done for three different types of weight functions i mentioned cloud in cell over here cic that uh, is shown by the uh, long dashed line which is in the middle so you can see that the rms dispersions are of the order of 10% uh, and they continue to remain around 10% for quite a few grid lengths. And because you have an isotropy of the mesh and weight functions, you end up having a transverse force component as well, which is not there in uh, Newtonian gravity. And that too kind of peaks somewhere between one and two grid lengths and then gradually dies down. So these issues were, uh, of course, studied uh, around the time when particle mesh simulations started getting used in uh, gravity. Uh, but what people were more worried about at that stage was that the dynamical range was limited because uh, use of mesh limits uh, your force resolution. The uh, force starts dipping below one by R square somewhere around the scale of one to one and a half grid lengths. And if you're doing 64 cube sim simulations, that is a serious limitation. Uh, 64 cube simulations, then it's a serious limitation. So first major effort came uh, in 1985, uh, P cubed M or particle, particle, particle mesh code. And uh, what F. Satyo, Davis, Frank and White did was to say that, all right, we have a particle mesh code. We know that the average force between two particles dips below one by R square. And uh, what we will do is we'll just add a correction so that it does not dip below uh, one by R square and continues to be like one by R square to much smaller scales. This can uh, improve dynamic range of simulations very significantly. The main problem uh, which they addressed somewhat tangentially in this paper and not at all in uh, later work was the problem of error in the particle mesh force which kind of uh, exists to very large scales. That was brought up in a paper by uh, Francois Boucher and Henry Kandrup, the same year as uh, the PQM paper, where they did an analytical expansion to estimate how much error in force there would be. And I draw your attention to this line over here, that if one uses the quite particle mesh technique, which was used in the F. Satyo et al. paper in 1985, then the uh, variation, the uh, and if you want 5% accuracy, then you have to go all the way up to 11 grid lengths, which means that you cannot trust results which are at scales of less than 10 grid lengths in the P cubed M code. That is a serious blow because what you are trying to push is uh, that you should be able to trust results below a grid level. And here you find that the error is significant uh, at all scales below 10 grid uh, lengths. So it continued with some uh, minor modifications. There were efforts to use uh, Barnes and Hutt tree code, which came out in 1986. Uh, Hanquist and Francois Boucher, they applied it to a uh, cosmological scenario. Unfortunately, it does not, the uh, tree PM, the, the tree code does not uh, naturally have a periodic boundary condition and folding that in itself brings in quite a, a serious amount of error. And tree codes are known to be somewhat slow, even though they scale as n log n, they are nowhere near as fast as uh, particle mesh codes. 
So uh, I suggested a way out uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, the, the original version of the manuscript was written in 1909. Uh, it kind of remained in limbo and finally I submitted it uh, later in 2002 where it was published in uh, JAA. So the way it works is this, that I have to solve the Poisson equation, which is uh, shown as the first equation on top right in Fourier space. Now, what I choose to do is to divide this, uh, the, the right hand side into two parts and uh, they will add up to what is the desire, whatever is the desired uh, expression. And now I want to solve for these two things separately, calling one as a long range potential, the other as a short range potential. Once I have done this, once I have written down these equations, I am also free to solve the Poisson equation for these two separately. One can be done in Fourier space, the long range part, and the short range part can be done in real space. Instead of taking the particle particle uh, pairwise summation approach, what I proposed was that we can use the tree method for uh, using the uh, calculating the short range force. On the right, you can see the split between the short range and the long range force. Uh, in the equations over here, you will notice a variable called RS that is a tunable parameter and we can choose its value uh, to either have uh, high speed in the code eventually or low errors or both. So here in, in the plot on the right, uh, RS is chosen to be one. And you can see that uh, the short range force, the long range force becomes negligible at a scale of somewhere around five grid lengths. So five times RS. So that allowed us to choose a radius within which the short range force has to be calculated. Uh, this is, these plots are uh, on error are from a much later paper with the Nishikant Khandai. This was written in 2009. There are error plots from earlier, the first paper as well, but I thought this is more illustrative. So, now we have two components of the force and both can in principle calculate, uh, contribute to the total error. So on the left, you see plots of uh, fractional, uh, the frequency with which uh, or fraction of particles that have an error greater than what is given on the X axis. And this is done for uh, different, uh, uh, different choice of uh, parameters. So I have RS as one parameter and in the tree part, I have an opening angle as another parameter. And you can see that as I uh, tweak these parameters, the error can be reduced quite significantly. Of course, it ends up uh, taking a lot of time as well. But, uh, and the other thing to notice is that if I look at the, uh, the plots on the left, but uh, right panels in this, these correspond to the smallest uh, opening angle. And you can see that the error variation in both of these is almost the same, which kind of indicates that probably the error is coming primarily from the long range force calculation. And this is uh, proven to some extent in the plots on the bottom right, where only the error in short range force is uh, plotted. And you can see that this is orders of magnitude below what we see in the total force. So this is something which we fixed uh, uh, moving forward by tweaking RS and uh, reducing the overall error in the force. So having a clear cut model allowed us to tweak, uh, tune our uh, code, not just tune in the sense of optimization, but in terms of implementation and uh, split between the long range and short range forces and uh, have an optimal code in terms of errors. In terms of time taken, uh, we uh, used another approach, which was to realize that if, if I have uh, particles which are very, very close to each other, the tree walk which is done for uh, doing the force calculation is almost identical. This is something which was uh, proposed by Barnes in 1989. Interesting paper titled uh, uh, A Modified Tree Code, Don't Laugh, It Runs. And uh, when we implemented it, we found to our surprise that it achieves something which, uh, which is highly desirable, but not so easy to get, which is cache optimization. So on top are two curves for two different types of CPUs. Uh, one is an Intel uh, Xeon precursor and the other is an AMD uh, Opteron. Uh, 
uh, you can see that as we increase the number of particles in the simulation, at some stage, the behavior goes away from n log n and it becomes n square. It's not that the uh, algorithm has gone bad and it is scaling improperly. It is just that we are hitting the limitations of hardware. When we put in this additional uh, uh, optimization, we, we were able to see a log n like behavior through and through out to largest simulations that uh, we needed to run. And uh, therefore, uh, we found that we had a highly optimal code. This code was used for a number of applications. Uh, I'll just uh, show you a glimpse of one. So what is shown over here is from a simulation which used uh, 10 to the 8 particles. This is dated 10 years ago, uh, done with the Nishikant Khandai. We were uh, looking for uh, developing an understanding of uh, clustering of galaxies that may be seen in uh, redshifted 21 centimeter line. And uh, what we found was that uh, the, the, the clustering of such galaxies was much, much stronger uh, in our models as compared to clustering of dark matter. So the thick black line shows the initial fluctuations in uh, dark matter, initial power spectrum of dark matter scaled linearly to this redshift. The red dashed line shows the nonlinear dark matter power spectrum at this redshift. And the dot dashed blue curve is the uh, clustering of galaxies uh, as computed from, uh, as estimated from our model for uh, the uh, redshifted one centimeter line. So we, we argued that the clustering is much, much higher uh, at small scales. And this was later on proven to be uh, so from independent uh, studies using the HALO model. And uh, because of this, the, the uh, attempts to target very large scales and statistical uh, detection may not be the best ones. It may be possible to detect uh, sing single large agglomerations of neutral hydrogen in the universe. So this is something which we proposed by using this particular method. Now I'll give you a summary for this part and move on to another part where I'll try to highlight uh, another uh, uh, work recently. So one is that a mathematical model for the problem is essential for estimation of errors and having tunable parameters permits tuning of error control and CPU time required. Uh, this is uh, absolutely essential and wonderful. And if you have ad hoc approach, then the results can be uncertain. And also uh, you, you don't know how to take the next step in some sense, because if you have a mathematical model at the first step, then you can tweak that, you can add to it, you can add uh, refinements to it, but if you are already at an ad hoc approach, adding things can become very, very hard. And the optimizations need to be aligned with capabilities of hardware. Uh, the work which I've described was done in collaboration with the two former students, Suridhi Prey and uh, Nishikant Kandai. Now I come to something which we have been doing in the last uh, four or five years. This is uh, some relativistic simulations. And the question that we wanted to address was uh, does dynamical dark energy affect structure formation in its nonlinear stages? Is there a signature of the type of dark energy models in structure formation and its galaxy clustering? And what is the response of dynamical dark energy to nonlinear perturbations in dark matter? As uh, there is no non-relativistic analog of dynamical dark energy models, it is not possible to kind of plug them in simply in uh, n-body simulations. Uh, parameterizations which are based on equation of state parameter and speed of sound can be used in linear perturbation theory. And uh, therefore, we needed to do relativistic simulations to address this particular question. And we felt that even if the answer comes out uh, negative, it is still something which is worth knowing because then it will justify using simpler techniques. So, General relativistic calculations are hard, even for the simplest of problems. So what we did was to simplify it and uh, worked with spherically symmetric uh, collapse of dark matter. This reduces the problem to one plus one dimensions. And uh, we thought that like the spherical collapse model of Gunn and Gott 1974, it should offer us enough insights to uh, figure out what to do next or figure out enough about uh, the questions which we are raising at this level itself. So step one, which we wanted to do was to study 
a class of dark energy models and step two is to compare different classes of models to look for differences and any comparison has to be done for the same expansion history in order to avoid confusion why do we want to do this kind of a comparison well one can show and it was shown about 20 years ago that you can take any class of dark energy models as long as your uh, measurements are only based on distances and scales uh, the answers which you get depend only on the expansion history and not on which class of uh, dark energy model you are using so that essentially means that you can uh, have uh, tens of thousands or even millions of uh, supernova type 1a observations you can uh, plug in cmb uh, observations you can plug in uh, bao observations you can do all of that but the only thing which you will figure out is what is the expansion history you will not have a clue as to which model of dark energy is the real model and whether uh, you will not be able to rule out any class of dark energy models on that ground so therefore uh, it is important to ask question and uh, these questions and look for observables which may depend on the type of dark energy model that you have so the first uh, work was published about uh, two two and a half years ago uh, this was done with my student manavendra pratap rajwanshi where we looked at uh, the canonical quintessence uh, models so we worked with the so tolman bondi okay. metric is there a question uh, no no i just wanted to say you have two more minutes uh, okay uh, i should be done yeah yeah so uh, the uh, so this is the tolman bondi metric and uh, uh, we have uh, equations for the metric coefficients we have the continuity equation and we have the equation for the scalar field and what we did was to work with initial perturbations which are compensated so that at large scales we can match up to the solution in the uh, friedman model what we found was that uh, the collapse of dark matter turn around derealization etc uh, does not seem to have any uh, dependence on what kind of dark energy model which we are using so we had this unperturbed uh, fluid and quintessence models over here dark energy did seem does have uh, perturbations and uh, we also see variations in the equation of state parameter uh, small but we still see them and these were uh, interesting uh, results that we had and we all, we found that if we if the dark matter perturbations are at larger scales they induce larger dark energy perturbations as compared to high amplitude perturbations in dark matter at smaller scales so this was another thing which we addressed so these uh, key results were uh, listed in the lower part of the abstract uh, i have already said most of this so let me skip ahead then we wanted to have a comparison with another uh, well defined class of dark energy models so what we did was to develop a technique for uh, uh, finding out the potentials which will give us any desired uh, expansion history for quintessence and uh, tachyon dark energy models we also looked at interacting dark matter dark energy models and then to compare with tachyons we of course had to set up equations for them this is uh, the analogous equations there you can see that the field equation here is uh, far more complex so this is uh, evolution of an under dense initially under dense region so essentially a void surrounded by an over dense region and uh, there are curves here for tachyon model and for quintessence model each of which is uh, tuned to give you a constant equation of state parameter values for the parameter chosen were minus half minus 0.9 and minus 0.975 you can see that in terms of dark matter clustering there is uh, absolutely no change no variation with the class of model uh, variations in uh, dark energy perturbations for uh, w greater than minus 1 you can see again the same set of models you can see that for minus 0.975 the tachyon and quintessence models coincide as you go towards minus 0.5 they develop differences which means dark energy perturbations have differences depending on which model you, which class of models you are looking at and that may in principle be a key 
However, differences between these models diminish for uh, one plus W much less than one, and hence prospects for differentiating between models using characteristics of perturbations are limited in our universe. So summary for part two, uh, at least spherical collapse of dark matter is not affected by the type of dark energy and only depends on expansion history. And this is uh, bad news from the point of view of trying to figure out which dark energy model is the correct model. But it is good news in the sense that if now if I want to run n body simulations for any dark energy model, I just have to take uh, smooth dark energy and that expansion history and I'm through. Perturbations in dark energy do depend on the dark energy models, but uh, we are plagued by two problems. The amplitude of these perturbations is anyway very small and the variation differences are significant only if one plus W is large and that regime is not allowed by observations. So thus we may conclude that we will not be able to use structure formation to pinpoint a model of dark energy. The main collaborator here is Manmendra Pratap Rajvanshi, the student who is uh, about to finish up. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Jasjit, uh, for a wonderful uh, talk. Uh, so I invite questions uh, from the participants. So please raise your hand and then uh, we will take it up from there. <clears throat> and you can also put your questions in the Slack channel. Okay, it seems that there are no questions so far. Uh, right, so anyway, if someone has questions, they can always get back. Yes, yes, sure. So thank you, Jasjit, once again uh, for your talk. Uh, so the thank next uh, speaker is uh, Girish Kulkarni, uh, who joins us from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. And uh, he will be speaking on cosmological radiative transfer uh, simulations. So Girish, could you please? Yeah. So let me see if I can get him. So is this, I hope it's visible. Yes. <clears throat> okay, great. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak uh, today. Uh, I've really enjoyed several of today's uh, talks. It's a really interesting idea uh, of a workshop. Um, I'm going to talk about cosmological radiation transport simulation. Uh, it's an, it's a, I think it's a very appropriate talk to uh, have after Jasjeet's Jajit, talk. Uh, Jasjeet has told us how uh, the matter perturbations can be evolved um, in uh, cosmological simulations. And now I, I would like to discuss what to do if radiation is put into the game. Uh, uh, I will also present some science results and these science results were developed in collaboration with the people listed on this uh, slide. Okay. So what are cosmological radiation transport simulations and why are we interested in them? Right? So cosmological radiation transport deals with the propagation of radiation from galaxies and black holes, uh, accreting black holes to cosmological scales. Okay. And the reason we are interested in doing this is because this radiation sets large scale cosmological properties. In particular, it sets the thermal and ionization properties of our universe. And interestingly, even if you are not interested in cosmology, uh, you might be interested in cosmological radiation transport because uh, the large scale thermal and ionization uh, properties of the universe may feed back into the properties of uh, galaxies and black holes that produce the radiation uh, in the first place. So this uh, cartoon uh, uh, shows the evolution of the universe from the Big Bang on the right hand side to, the, to today's universe on the left hand side. And several important milestones in the cosmic evolution are shown. For example, the formation of CMB at redshift of a thousand. Now the period after the formation of CMB, which is called dark ages on this slide, is, is kind of very simple and straightforward as far as uh, radiation physics goes. It's just CMB and its uh, interaction with matter is uh, totally well understood and simple. 
but then at the end of the dark ages non trivial astrophysical objects start appearing there is at some point presumably the formation of the first star the first galaxy the first black hole and so on and these objects start producing complex spectra of radiation which propagate through large scales to cosmological distances and they have significant cosmological impacts so one important effect is for example called reionization on this slide in which this radiation produced by these objects um ionizes most of the hydrogen content of the universe okay so at the end of reionization as i have shown on this cartoon uh, all of the hydrogen is ionized and there is a significant change in the thermal state of the universe okay so i hope you get the idea that these small scale objects like galaxies produce radiation and it's important to understand how this radiation propagates through cosmological volumes in order to understand the effect of this radiation on the cosmology okay so that's cosmological radiation transport so how do you do it how do you do the computation well you do it by means of the cosmological radiative transfer equation okay so as mo most of you may know radiation is usually quantified in radiation transport by means of the quantity specific intensity it denoted usually by i nu which is a function of the time the spatial position and the direction at each position um uh, and the goal then becomes computing the value of i nu at each point in a cosmological volume and this can be done by solving the cosmological radiation transfer equation which is written here okay it's a six dimensional partial differential equation fairly complex looking there are three terms on the left hand side and two terms on the right hand side the first term on the left, left hand side is uh, uh, quantifying the temporal evolution the time evolution of the radiation intensity the second term then quantifies the spatial evolution of the radiation intensity then there is a big third term um, which brings in the effects of the expansion of the universe and then finally on the right hand side you have these two terms two important terms in which this term j nu is the sources of radiation okay the emission of the radiation the uh, uh, processes that produce radiation and the quantity minus kappa nu i nu uh which quantifies the absorption of the radiation by matter distribution in the universe so in other words if i specify j nu and kappa nu by means of a cosmological simulation such as those for example which we saw in just jeet's talk i could then plug them into this equation and hope to solve this equation at every point in a cosmological volume to get my i nu okay and that would be a successful computation of the cosmological radiation transport now it's this doing this is hard there are two main challenges one is the problem of dynamical range okay the cosmological effects that we are talking about is at scales of tens to hundreds of megaparsecs but the radiation is produced and even absorbed at scales of parsecs or kiloparsecs very small scales okay so for example here i am showing a density slice from a cosmological simulation at redshift of about 6 you want to calculate radiation effect on these scales 80 megaparsec over edge but the radiation that is but that radiation is being produced on scales which you can barely resolve on this slide slice so that's one problem how do you fit the problem into a computer right that's a that's why you need a lot of nodes for these simulation and the second problem is the speed of light problem which is that radiation moves very fast so you need very small time steps compared to uh, gravity uh, structure formation you need really small time steps uh, to evolve the radiation transport problem so so the computation becomes slow so how do what do we do if we are faced with these two problems several solutions have been uh, devised uh, to sort of work around these challenges and these solutions i think we can classify in basically two categories the first category of solutions is called ray tracing methods of doing cosmological rt uh, in in ray tracing methods you basically trace rays from sources to each cell in the cosmological volume and the property of ray tracing methods is that their execution time generally scales as the uh, product of the number of cells and the number of sources and several codes apply this uh, technique for example c2 ray licoris crash or some of the well known names that you may have heard which apply ray tracing methods the problem however is that this dependence on the source number is challenging because in a cosmological volume you have billions of sources and in fact each cell can be its own source because it can emit secondary radiation because of recombinations 
So when this was realized, people quickly found that ray tracing methods are not a solution. Really, you cannot really go to very large boxes. Dynamical range still remains uh, limited. So what people did was they came up with moment-based methods in which you actually throw away your equation, that radiation transfer equation, and you solve only its moments. Okay, I'll show a, an example soon. So for example, you could solve only the monopole and dipole angular moments of the equation, which are two new equations now. They are averaged equation. So that's how the simplification has occurred. And it turns out that the monopole and dipole angular equations basically then convert the problem to a kind of fluid dynamic problem and then the method scales as order of n cells so the source cell source number dependence is completely gone and that's a huge breakthrough this is this was this is for example implemented in codes such as aton enzo rt and art uh, where people have uh, 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 been able to achieve very large dynamical ranges because the num dependence on the number of sources is gone so i'll quickly show uh, so, so in my work, we have been favoring moment-based radiation transport for this reason. So I'll quickly show what this method looks like and then show some show our setup and some results that we have been getting. So the basic idea of the moment-based radiation transport actually was given in 1968. Uh, and the idea is basically you reduce the dimensionality of this complicated partial differential equation by taking averages. And the cost is you introduce some assumptions, which may be ad hoc uh, to use just Jeet's language, right? which may not have very good physical grounding, but that's the cost you tolerate. So the, what you do is you begin with your big cosmological radiation transport equation, and you begin for cosmological purposes at higher redshift by neglecting the Hubble term. Okay? It turns out that this is not a bad approximation. So you get a plain old radiation transport equation. There is a factor of one over A because we are doing this in co-moving unit. But now what you do is you take angular moments of this equation, and you get two new differential equations. So the first differential equation on this slide is the zeroth angular moment. And the second differential equation is the first angular moment. You can go on like that, second, third, fourth, but you stop at the second and you notice something interesting. First of all, our quantity I nu has gone away. Instead of that, two new quantities have appeared, N nu and F nu. So what I could try to do is I could try to solve the first differential equation here to get my N nu. It turns out N nu is just a scalar, the photon number density. Now I can't do that. I can't solve this because I don't know my F nu, which it turns out is the photon flux. So then, but it turns out that my first moment equation, the second equation on this slide gives the photon flux differential equation, which is, uh, which I could solve to get my F, but it has the second angular moment, which is this tensor P. But now I could choose to write the second angular moment equation and solve it to get P. But what people do in moment-based methods is instead of that, they stop here and they just write an assumed form of the pressure tensor P. So for example, one particular algorithm for RT is called M1 closure algorithm in which this particular pressure tensor is used. There's no point in understanding the details uh, at, at this point. There is just a bunch of numbers, looks pretty ad hoc and it is actually to some extent ad hoc. But this pressure tensor is postulated and used to close this system of equations. Once you have this pressure tensor, you can get the flux. Once you get the flux, you can get the photon number density at all points in a cosmological volume. So this idea was first applied around 2007 and 2008 for cosmological problems. What I have been doing is I've been using this moment-based idea to study reionization. Okay? And the way we have been doing it is by running large cosmological hydrodynamical simulations. So here is a density field from one such simulation and running moment-based radiation transport on that. Okay. We are using a, a code called Aton, which was originally developed by Aubert and Tessier. We have added our, our own features on that code now, uh, but this code implements this M1 closure idea of moment-based um, radiation transport. What do we get in return of this? is the world's biggest reionization simulation in terms of dynamic range. Okay? It's a 160 megaparsec uh, box, which resolves scales down to 80 kiloparsecs. Okay? So this is unprecedented. And as I will show, just doing this gives us new physical insight uh, in uh, high redshift cosmology. So here is how this, uh, this simulation looks like. I'll just play this uh, uh, visualization. The left-hand side plot shows the how the radiation is moving out of the sources and ionizing hydrogen in a cosmological volume. The right-hand side plot shows the uh, concomitant temperature evolution. 
Yeah, you can see that the uh, sources are this tiny, almost subgrid uh, galaxies, but they are having radiative effects which are um, uh, cosmological in scale. Okay, so the method successfully captures this growth of ionized regions and their temperature and chemical evolution. Okay. Um, what is really remarkable about the M1 closure, there are other moment-based methods available, but this M1 closure has a remarkable property that it is local. The radiation actually feels like a fluid in these uh, simulations, and therefore they are ideally suited to GPUs. And so we have ported Aton to GPUs, and this gives a significant acceleration in the code. So for example, this plot shows the executive uh, execution uh, time per time step as a number of problem size, um, and the red line is how long it takes to do the problem on a CPU, whereas uh, uh, the blue line is how long it takes on the GPU. And you can see it's a better than an order of magnitude improvement. Okay? We take about 700 GPU hours to do the kind of simulations I just showed in that animation. Okay, So it's amazing. We got a good RT algorithm, but then we also got this bonus of being able to use it on the GPUs. The scaling is almost perfect. The left-hand plot shows the speed up as a function of number of GPUs. The blue line is the perfect scaling and the green dots are the actual performance. We have now extended this out to 512 GPUs and it just keeps going quite well. And again, that's just a, a corollary of the local nature. The right-hand plot shows where the compute time is going um, and most of it is going in the radiation transport, which is good because radiation transport is under control thanks to the M1 closure. So that's uh, the concept of cosmological RT, uh, the challenges and the interesting algorithms developed to meet those challenges and how we are using uh, those interesting algorithms. What are the science benefits? So the first science benefit that we have managed to extract is, uh, is related to the high redshift Lyman alpha forest. Okay, so for those of you who are not into this field, I'll quickly introduce this concept. Uh, Lyman alpha forest is a feature you see in the spectra of some high redshift objects like quasars. So this is uh, shown in, uh, this is how real data looks like uh, for Lyman alpha forest in this plot, uh, which shows intensity as a function of wavelength, the spectra of two quasars. The bottom quasar is farther away. And you see that in this bottom quasar, there is this dense network of absorption lines, which is what is called Lyman alpha forest. Okay, so what's the big deal? The big deal is that this forest its structure depends on the cosmological density structure, the kind that Jasjeet evolved in his talk, and gas physics, the kind that I have been trying to study. Uh, so therefore, it's a very rich probe of various cosmological uh, uh, physics problems. And in particular, for people like me, it can offer clues to understanding uh, reionization. Okay. Now, one of the interesting features in the high redshift Lyman alpha forest was that at redshift greater than five, the Lyman alpha forest shows a very large spatial fluctuation. This was noted in real data in the last five, six years, um, that Lyman alpha forest in one part of the sky is very different from that in the other, in, a, in other parts of the sky. So on this figure, the left-hand side panel, the smaller panel shows the strength of the Lyman alpha absorption or the opacity tau effective as a function of redshift in various spectra. And you see that it grows up it's, it increases as a function of redshift. So the absorption in the Lyman alpha forest is getting stronger. But in the right-hand side plot, what is shown is the distribution function of these absorption strengths in different redshift bins. And you see that these distributions are not vertical lines. They are not step function, they are broad distribution, which means that the opacity is spread out, as you can see in the left panel as well, over large ranges of values. Now you might say, okay, so what's uh, so uh, uh, important about that? It turned out that that was very unusual. None of the contemporary models in the last five years could explain that spread. It was not known why this happens at all. It turned out that when we did these M1 closure-based radiation transport simulation, the simulation perfectly reproduced these spatial fluctuations. And so it, basically the idea was that uh, these GPU-based radiation transport simulation had achieved the sweet spot of a volume. They were truly cosmological and they were doable. They were physical. So, so speed and volume uh, uh, were achieved to solve this problem. It turned out in, in terms of physics, the reason we have these fluctuations is because of delayed and patchy reionization. So the blue curves on this is our simulation and the red curve is the data. Okay, so here is another way of looking at the results from this simulation. These are light cones of evolution of various quantities from redshift eight to five. 
the top light cone shows the neutral hydrogen, the middle light cone shows the ionization rate, and the bottom light cone shows the temperature. And there is, a, there is a rich amount of physics here. I'm just showing this to you as an illustration of what these simulation produce. There is a lot of information on this slide that one can discuss if one is interested. One reason we got excited about this development, totally enabled by technology, GPUs, and algorithmic development, M1 closure, was that we are now for the first time uh, approaching a concordant reionization model. Okay, so on the left hand side in this panel, I'm showing the evolution of the ionized hydrogen fraction in the blue curve in these simulations and compare it with various other observations at high redshift, and they all seem to start agreeing with each other. The right hand side panel shows the Thomson scattering optical depth to the CMB last scattering surface, and it agrees perfectly well almost with the um, uh, Planck uh, measurement. Okay, so suddenly the simulation, the confidence in the simulation is not because we have mathematically shown that it's the correct solution, but it seems to agree with so much data. There are other benefits of the dynamic range. So this is the, for the first time we can start asking truly cosmological questions to astrophysics simulation. So here is one such result. It's about CMB. And this is a crowded plot and I apologize for that, but it's a simple plot actually. What it is showing is the power spectrum of the so-called B mode polarization signal, uh, signal of the CMB, okay? CLBB as a function of L. And the red curve it shows the amount of B mode polarization induced by the free electrons produced during deionization in these simulations in the CMB. And the other curves on this plot show primordial, expected primordial signals for various inflationary theories, experimental sensitivities, and current data. But the cool thing about the red curve is it's the first radiation transfer prediction of a CMB result. Okay, so first radiation transfer result of a secondary anisotropy result. A second beneficiary of these simulations has been 21 centimeter science. As we all know, uh, experiments like SKR, trying to detect 21 centimeter from cosmological uh, 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 scales. Um, again, it was difficult to predict this without such simulations. Uh, what is shown here is the 21 centimeter power spectrum. The left panel is at redshift 5.6, the right panel is at 5.4. The black solid curve is the result from this simulation. So why, what is so special? What is so special is that the simulation now tells us that below redshift six, the power spectrum is orders of magnitude higher than what was expected when these experiments were uh, designed. Okay, the ex expectation is shown by the dotted curve on this uh, on these figures. In fact, the sensitivities of some of these experiments uh, are shown in the colored curves. You can see that the simulation suggests that this should be detectable by SKA. This is good news because these redshifts are far easier to operate at in radio astronomy compared to redshifts of say seven or eight, which people used to think matter more. So this is work by our postdoc Janaki Raste, who is actually presenting this result in the SKA workshop today. Okay, this is also interesting in my opinion for synergies at these redshift with other experiments. Good, so I mean, so clearly it has helped us. Uh, I hope you got an I got a sense of how uh, uh, computational uh, innovations have really solved, uh, uh, solved some important science, physics problems in this area. But the story is not over. There is There are challenges. There are some shortcomings. Uh, there are some algorithmic, technological, and physics challenges which future work needs to tackle. So for example, we don't yet know whether M1 closure is accurate enough. Okay, We, we don't have that kind of analytical understanding of M1 closure yet. There are suggestions that it may be inaccurate at certain in certain areas to up to even 20%. Okay. Um, I, I, I emphasize that we have great dynamical range, but it might still not be sufficient. Uh, there are some suggestions that we are still missing small scale structure. We need to push harder. Um, some of you may have noticed that we have, the results I've shown were done in post-processing. The cosmological structure was evolved first and then radiation was evolved. What this misses is the back reaction between radiation and hydrodynamics. We are coming up with some hacks to uh, solve this, but this needs to have, this begs some elegant solutions. And we still can't do enough simulations to traverse cosmological parameter space for solving important problems like dark matter and dark energy. So I'll conclude there. Um, I, hope, I hope I've given you a sense of uh, uh, what cosmological radiative transfer simulations are and why they are essential for various problems in cosmology. 
uh, the M1 closure algorithm combined with GPUs have resulted in the biggest reionization simulations on the planet. And this is not just fun. This is not just doing something biggest just for the sake of it. Getting to this magnitude has solved new problems. Uh, there are future tasks, uh, future problems ahead, both in analytical side of developing better algorithms and in terms of physics and technology in running these codes. We are currently running a large uh, uh, suite of such simulations on various national facilities. And I think, I'm not sure if this was mentioned today, but we are also experimenting in India of running these simulations on the commercial cloud. So I'll be very happy to discuss uh, that uh, side of uh, HPC in India with people if they are interested. So I've got a bit above time. Sorry about that, but I'll stop here. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Girish, uh, for an interesting talk and also for bringing up this issue of commercial cloud uh, applications. Uh, <clears throat> so I, uh, so we can take a few more questions now. Uh, so please raise your hand if you can. Uh, Sharanya is co-host. I cannot raise my hand, but can oh I yeah, please. Uh, yes, uh, Jasya, please go ahead. Yeah. So Girish, has anyone uh, experimented with doing the closure at higher moment and checking uh, what happens? Uh, no, uh, Jasjit. So that's a good question. And uh, I think I'm confident in saying that there is not a single study do it, considering that. Uh, there are people in neutrino transport simulations who have tried to consider that, but it's an entirely different problem and they have only done that in 1D. Okay. So there is uh, no one who has looked at higher moments, no. The other thing which I wanted to ask was the power spectrum which you plotted uh, for H1. This is uh, only the IGM or it has the galaxy contribution as well? Uh, this is only the IGM, yeah. So it's in some sense a lower bound. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Dipanjan, you can go ahead and ask your question. Um, thanks, Sharanya. Thanks, Kirish, for this nice talk. And again, following up on Jajji's question, my question was again related to the M1. So M1 is the default scheme to go to nowadays for the RT schemes because it's, it gives very nicely within these two, two limits of optical thin and thick. However, uh, there is some inherent assumptions of symmetry. And as for a single source, it works perfectly fine. When you have multiple sources, there are some approximations and uh, inaccuracies that may creep in. So do you have any estimate or thought on that? What, on what level or percentage that can affect the results? Yeah, so this is obviously a very important question. I think serious work is urgently needed on that, but it's also a really hard question. So there is precisely just one paper uh, which has attempted an answer to the question of what, how, in, how inaccurate M1 is in a few source case. And even there, they have only, be able, only been able to look at 1D problems. Uh, analytically, it's really difficult to tackle this. Right. Uh, I'm not, there is a lot of literature in the early uh, 80s, 70s, uh, where people were interested in stellar uh, physics, uh, radiation transport. Perhaps uh, somebody has looked at in that set of papers and books. Uh, but yeah, I don't think any of the cosmological RT members, community members have good understanding of But even for the case that you mentioned that works with four sources or so, how much does that affect? Uh, uh, if you, if you, do they have an error budget that they can, could produce there? Yeah, so the difficulty of that is we don't have an analytical solution in that case to compare with. And we know that, for example, even ray tracing and so on, they are done with additional approximation. I mean, it might sound like ray tracing is exact, but it's never exact. You cannot do ray tracing in the exact limit. As a result, they are, they are also approximate. So the best you can hope to do is compare different algorithms. You can compare M1 with ray tracing. There we find that they are roughly kind of similar, but that doesn't tell us much because the ray tracing inaccuracy is also kind of unknown. The, the, uh, the missing link is, the, uh, is a good analytical solution in a uh, few uh, source case, uh, which we don't have. Thanks. Okay, so any more questions, uh, please raise your hand uh, or just let me know. Uh, I don't see anything on the Slack yet. Uh, no, Sharana, there is a question. Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. So, so there's a question on Slack. I'll just read it to you, Girish, uh, by uh, Borun Maiti. Uh, so he is curious about how might the results be affected if that pressure tensor is assumed to be of a different form. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, a good question. Uh, this has been looked into. Um, the pressure tensor, currently two forms are being used. One is the form M1 closure form that I have uh, given. The other form that is also relatively popular is the variable 
Eddington tensor. Uh, uh, but and both of these have some compromises. Some uh, the variable Eddington tensor works in optically thin limit. M1 works better in optically thick limit. So we prefer M1 and so on. Um, so yes, there has been a systematic study of how these compare with each other. Uh, uh, there are quantitative lessons, uh, but beyond a certain limit, it's not clear what that comparison really tells us as the function was pointing out. But yes, uh, uh, I think there is also a classical paper in 1984 uh, in which they have analytically studied tens of uh, uh, forms of the pressure tensor. The particular form that I used in my M1 closure is kind of a Lorentz transformed black body. So it's isotropic in some inner shield frame. It's not clear why that's a good choice in reionization. <laughs> it's not a Lorentzian black body in reionization, but but it seems to work. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so we have a few more uh, minutes until we take a break for the next session. Uh, so maybe we just continue on this uh, discussion and uh, people can ask questions on all the four uh, talks which were there in this session. So of course, uh, Roby had to leave because uh, he had a meeting to attend, so I will send him the questions uh, by mail. Uh, so, <clears throat> so Girish, I just had one naive question. Uh, so when you're solving this equation for this radiative transfer, uh, you see there are grid codes where uh, in cases of uh, star formation, so people make use of adaptive mesh uh, refinement. Uh, so, so what kind of complications do we run into when you try to solve this kind of equation on, a, on an adaptive grid? Yeah, right. Yeah. So that's a very good question. Uh, this has been attempted. There is a start already uh, by Roman Tessier and his collaborators, uh, the code called Ramses RT. Yes. Um, I think the first challenge that you face when you try to do this adaptively is that of the time scale that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. The time scale is set by this delta x over c, the current condition. And uh, in adaptive schemes, the time step, time step can become so small that the whole problem will basically just keep stuck right. will remain stuck at lower levels uh, of yes. the adaptive scheme um, there are two ways in which this has been solved one is you use different time stepping criterion at each stage um, and the second way is coming up with clever in combinations of implicit and explicit techniques um, there is a lot of active work i'm not sure if there is a clean consensus yeah in which one can say that this is the way to go i think people are sort of groping uh, for the moment for the best way forward but ramses rt has kind of uh, made a start but yeah. maybe okay. i'll just uh, I'll briefly pinch in here so on this if time scale girish is the main uh, criteria that is um, that is a bottleneck i i think uh, ramses rt also has a reduced speed of light option of yeah. implemented somewhere so does that help in uh, alleviating some of the things or it's equally bad uh, yeah, so that's a good point. So uh, reduced speed of light was the first solution that people came in. I think the idea came from Nick Nedin uh, when people realized that the speed of light is a problem, uh, and it, it went. It it was a good solution. It solves everything. It makes everything very manageable. But it has been recently found that it doesn't really give good answers. So the problem occurs when these ionization fronts overlap. See, until the ionization fronts overlap. The main challenge is the speed of ionization fronts is reduced when you also reduce the speed of light. Okay, so this was not very well appreciated before. Yeah. And because when ionization fronts are small, they're kind of isolated, the reduction in speed is not that much. So you, you, don't, you can't tell much, but when they become bigger and they start overlapping, you can really tell the differences. And unfortunately, that's where all the observational data is. Uh, so slowly in the last, uh, there, are, there haven't been any innovations on the reduced speed of light since then i think this has just that idea has just gone uh, away now so i think the main uh, development at the moment is uh, coming up with better implicit methods and better subcycling strategies to do this and at the I moment think, uh, the best I, uh, ramses rt there again so yeah i think just to add to what girish is saying um, there are uh, several implicit explicit schemes like the imx schemes which actually people use for relativistic uh, resistivity now, this is uh, exactly similar to your M1 closure because you also have a diffusion term in your resistivity. And therefore, and it's also based on the speed of light. So there are various uh, mainly led by Luca Del Zana, who has developed these echo code, which does this relativistic uh, resistivity simulations. 
and they have developed these IMX schemes to handle such uh, such kind of uh, things, which you may have want to look into for uh, for Ramesh's RT or for for Anton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, that's that's useful. Okay. So I just want to get in on the point which uh, Girish mentioned in the final conclusions about using commercial cloud thing. Uh, so could you uh, could you give us a you know a brief uh, you know what you are doing and how you access it? I mean, suppose I am from an institute or somebody is from a university, uh, and uh, so I am aware of uh, you know uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, they have recently introduced this Green Lake, uh, which is also an HPC cloud uh, platform. Uh, so it's it's almost like pay as you go. I mean, whatever you require, you pay for it, and then uh, you know it saves a lot in terms of capital costs uh, for the institute and things like that. Uh, so could you please uh, tell us something about your? Uh, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. So I'm very happy to talk about it at the moment. I'm kind of uh, uh, yeah. So so let me say a few things. Uh, I think. Uh, we have been using commercial cloud and TIFR for six months now. Uh, we are, uh, until so far, we are completely satisfied with it. Uh, I'm sure some problems will come up at some point in future. So far, things are really uh, good. Uh, as you said, uh, the commercial, we were first, this was brought to our attention by our colleagues in Perth, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the radio astronomy uh, people in Perth, uh, who are our collaborators in SK Science. And they have been, uh, we heard that they were preferring commercial cloud for HPC um, uh, in preference to their on-campus uh, data yeah. centers. Yeah. Uh, so this got us really interested and uh, we then kind of probed this idea further. Uh, we found that the, there are some distinct advantages and then I'll come to some potential disadvantages as well. Uh, one advantage is that commercial cloud is extremely flexible. Uh, what you get in commercial cloud is a range of architectures in one go. Whereas when we buy cloud, uh, when we buy HPC systems on campus or something, we sort of have to stick with that architecture for at least a period of five years or so. Yeah. Whereas uh, so if, if, if one morning I have to do a GPU simulation, I allocate a GPU on the cloud. If another morning I want to do a really tiny visualization, I can uh, spawn a really low, old, low cost old CPU. So that flexibility is important. Uh, the second thing is the reliability is very high because of the redundancy. It's just, just, just an economy of scale argument. The data centers of these commercial vendors are so much bigger than anything that uh, uh, we can uh, afford uh, that everything is so redundant that it's 100% uptime essentially. Right. Uh, the third interesting point that I felt was uh, that it was extremely easy to set up. Uh, it, it has been a challenge in India to set up uh, HPC on campus and then manage the maintenance and support. Uh, this thing just doesn't, is not there. The purchase happens almost instantaneously and you start using the HPC. And then the final thing I felt, which was really important for many of us here, is that I believe that cloud-based HPC gives us a method in India to leapfrog. Uh, compared to users in, say, United States and Europe. And the reason being that on cloud, if you are willing to spend some extra money, you can jump to uh, uh, the most cutting edge architecture, which it would have taken much longer to arrive on campus at your institution. Uh, and I think I think that's something that we... we but we, there is also we, the issue we, of, uh, you know, how much it costs and... Uh... Correct. So now, you have an institute wide subscription, or uh, is it an individual payment basis uh, supported from your grants or whatever? I mean, right, yeah. right. So I think, yeah, cost is uh, an interesting question. Uh, so, so, interestingly, uh, again, because it's commercial, the cost is really strange model. It took us months just to understand how to quantify the cost in commercial cloud. For example, there is uh, this thing called spot. Uh, instances on commercial cloud in which if you are willing to stop your codes at any time on short notice, the cost of the same CPU drops by sometimes as much as factor of 10. And yeah. almost all astrophysics codes have checkpointing, so we are happy yeah. to stop. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, what happens is we get, uh, we get CPU and GPU access to a really fraction of the cost compared to what it would be. But whether going to the uh, going to the cloud will necessarily end up saving uh, money is unfortunately not a black and white question. 
So for example, I think for a person living in Mumbai, it probably does save money because the space is costly here. Power is costly. Right. Manpower is costly. Uh, but perhaps if, for example, TIFR's campus in Hyderabad, it, the costs are much lower and therefore there you can compete with the cloud-based cost perhaps. So we are doing a quantitative uh, uh, study of these cost comparisons at the moment and I have, I'll hopefully have some numbers at some point. Um, on the other hand, there is a lot of data uh, that people have obtained uh, on cost comparisons at other places, at other academic places across the world. And there, what people have found is that co uh, cloud can be made cheaper. You know, you can just like you can go to spot instances, you can uh, you can you can tune your uh, workflows uh, to uh, to achieve significant uh, cost cutting on the cloud. Uh, so, uh, because I think finally it boils down to an economy of scale thing, right? If you yeah. buy one process, one GPU at your place, it's going to be much more costly than that one GPU on the cloud simply because they have millions of those. Right. Um, so it's not, unfortunately, regarding cost, I don't have a black and white answer. <laughs> there is a strong suspicion that it's uh, potentially cheaper, uh, but more work is needed. And we are doing that at the moment. Uh, we are doing okay. quantitative on work. Okay, thanks. Uh, I will get back to you with more <laughs> queries if I have on that. <laughs> Uh, so meanwhile, uh, you have one Slack question, so which you may want to attend there on Slack. Uh, so I will close uh, this session and uh, we are going to take a break for 10, 15 minutes uh, to come back to the last session, uh, which will be uh, moderated by Dipanjan. Uh, so Dipanjan, I'll make you a host from here, from yes. here on. Uh, so okay. thanks again to all the speakers uh, for uh, being here and presenting their talks. Uh, I enjoyed all of them till now. Uh, so thank you very much. And so we study. Study convene at uh, four forty-five. Yes, yes. So I have made you yes, the yes. host. Yes, yes. convene at four forty-five. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. For the last session.
Uh, I don't see Shukanta online. Shukanta, are you online? Uh, Shukanto, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Dipanjan. What about my audio? I have made you a co-host now, so they can share your screen. Uh, we'll start in about two minutes. Uh, sounds good. Let me test out my screen. Okay, I'll stop my share. Okay, your slides are visible. Thank you. Can you, okay, let me see if I can, yeah, you can see the slides change, right? We can see them change. Thank okay, you. Perfect. Yes, yes, we can. We can. So we'll we can. start in about one minute, Shivam. Thank you. Yeah. Sounds good. Maybe we'll just wait one more minute to let the people come back in. We have left. It's 4.45, so we'll start at 4.46. I have about 69 participants now. Okay. Um, yeah, I dropped out for a second. Um, okay. So is, you, you have been made a co-host again, okay? Yeah, thanks. There's a thunderstorm brewing in Pune. So. Yes, yes, I know. Uh, <laughs> I might have to go back wet when I go back from office. Yeah. Be anyway. careful, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just worried that my uh, the internet connection doesn't drop out and we have a blackout completely. <laughs> no, it's okay. Although we have UPS, so we should be fine. So okay, now uh, let us uh, start, start the last session of, of this workshop. It has been a very um, interesting workshop with a wide diverse area of topics being covered, starting from the first session where we had a wide overview of different types of architectures that we run our codes on and more generalized views. And then we had uh, two for subsequent sessions with more specific uh, science topics and uh, we'll continue that in session four on astrophysical relativity. We'll have three talks again uh, by Shukanta Bose, Indranil Chattopadhyay, and Pradesh Kumar. Um, speakers will have 20 minutes. I'll give you a warning at the 18th minute, and uh, we'll have five minutes of Q&A after the talk. So uh, Shukanta, off to you on comprehending nature's densest objects. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dipanjan. Um, let me begin by thanking uh, ASI and the organizers, uh, uh, Dipanjan and his colleagues. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll have to close my window because of the storm. But um, I'm, I'm happy to talk about uh, this uh, topic on basically gravitational wave discoveries that have happened in the last 
five years. Um, and uh, it seems that uh, what these um, uh, messengers of gravity are telling us, I mean, they're in some sense complementing um, some of the things we uh, know from electromagnetic Shukandu. observations. Shukandu, um, sorry, we cannot still see the screen if you have shared it. Oh. Yeah, so you have to already share the screen, Shukandu. Uh, sorry, thanks for letting me know. Can you see it now? Yes. yes. All right, so, and uh, what you see on this first slide uh, is an artist's impression of uh, uh, LIGO India. Um, the site has been uh, fully procured and in fact, uh, construction is ongoing at the moment. Uh, we are still waiting for the final project um, sanction, but um, uh, hopefully we'll get it um, in the coming months. Um, what I show in the coming slides uh, have benefited from um, work from a, a, a few collaborations here. So what you see in the second slide is a menagerie of gravitational wave sources, all binaries uh, of mainly you know, binary black hole and binary neutron star types. Um, and uh, they were discovered because of um, the efforts of the LIGO, Virgo, and um, mainly those two collaborations. And more recently, the Kagura collaboration from Japan um, has also joined. Um, but um, the LIGO scientific collaboration, uh, uh, of course, has a representation from many Indian institutions in the form of the LIGO India scientific collaboration. And their work is also partly represented in these slides. Uh, what you see uh, in this picture um, is on the vertical axis, I've plotted the masses, the component masses of the binaries. Um, so in solar mass, uh, near the, uh, the horizontal separation uh, doesn't mean anything here, um, except that they help the viewing. Um, so uh, the galactic neutron stars uh, are, no, are, are shown in um, yellow. Uh, these are basically the ones um, um, that are seen in binary systems. Um, but you will find uh, towards the center of the panel near the bottom, um, a couple of pairs of um, orange uh, sp spots, which actually represent the binary neutron stars that have been discovered by uh, LIGO and Virgo. And uh, they coalesce to form uh, uh, objects shown in white uh, in the mass gap region between about two and five solar mass. Um, uh, we assume these are black holes, maybe the lightest black holes, but we have not seen any signals from them. So that is um, a part uh, or a component of the future discovery space where signals from these um, post-merger objects may actually confirm uh, whether we are observing, you know, the lightest neutron stars, I'm sorry, the heaviest neutron stars or the lightest black holes. Uh, but if you go up uh, to uh, the part of the diagram showing heavier masses, then in purple, you see the uh, black holes, um, again, in the galaxy known through electromagnetic observations. But in blue, uh, we see the um, uh, close to, uh, you know, um, uh, 50 uh, binary black holes observed by LIGO and Virgo. And um, this clearly showed that uh, most of the black holes that are now known to mankind are uh, quite a bit heavier than um, the masses we could sample uh, through black holes in our galaxy. Um, so this uh, demographic information is useful, for example, to understand how, the, how these black holes are formed in the first place, because there are multiple channels um, that may be in the works. And some of this you may have heard um, in um, uh, Sharof Chatterjee's talk earlier today. Um, so third slide, what have we learned so far? Uh, first, black hole mergers are uh, quite common. Um, the most do not reveal much spin. Um, that is something we have learned. We, we did not know this for sure. Um, uh, on the other end, a few of them actually show clear indication of presence of you know, spinning black holes. So, so it, mean, it means that spins are not completely ruled out because there are theoretical models that suggest that uh, black holes can form without spin. I mean, these have cosmological implications through the formation of primordial black holes. Um, uh, but um, on the other hand, if um, uh, we did observe many black, black holes with spins, uh, that would have supported a dynamic uh, formation channel where uh, through maybe you know, three body or quasi oscillations, we uh, in globular clusters, uh, we, we see these binaries form. Um, um, but um, uh, it's, it's maybe we should wait for more data before we can conclusively say whether that formation channel is really quiet or not. Um, second, um, yeah, as I just showed you on the previous slide, uh, black holes can be quite massive um, uh, in galactic 
black holes, we find them to be um, to have masses of up to about 20 solar mass or so. Uh, but here we find them to be much more massive. I mean, um, for stellar mass all the way to um, over 50 solar masses, but maybe we are even touching um, or, or uh, probing into the intermediate mass black hole regime where with a recent discovery of GW1905-21, uh, it seems um, uh, we, are, we are observing black holes that are you know, touching uh, at around 100 uh, solar mass in mass. Uh, third, the distribution, uh, that is the distribution of these black holes that we have sampled uh, is across um, quite a range of redshift. Uh, that 19 zero, um, uh, the heaviest um, black hole merger um, was found at a, a pretty high redshift. Um, so, which means that um, we can use these objects um, um, as standard candles. Um, uh, we call them standard sirens because we can um, quote unquote hear the gravitational waves from them, but we can't see them. Um, so we can use them um, as standard sirens um, because uh, their masses or absolute luminosity uh, can be harnessed from the modulation of their gravitational waveforms. Um, to be able to measure H naught, the Hubble parameter, but also perhaps uh, the dark energy equation of state. So that remains, so, yeah, we have done some measurements, um, but uh, they're not precise enough to be able to um, sway uh, the jury on whether, for example, you know, the shoes uh, measurements are more accurate um, um, or, um, or the CMB measurements. Number four, uh, we have probed properties of dense matter, um, basically nuclear matter in neutron star mergers, and I'm going to show a slide or two about that. Um, and number five, uh, through the binary neutron star observation at 40 megaparsec, we have actually established quite firmly that indeed kilonovi are associated with uh, short gamma ray bursts, and that short gamma ray bursts are actually caused by binary neutron star mergers. Um, so, so, uh, and also we have learned more about the uh, SR, SGRB engine itself. And finally, uh, well, I'm not covering all points perhaps, but at least on this slide, um, we have not been able to disprove general relativity. So we have subjected it to various tests and um, it has so far uh, passed all of them. Um, but uh, how do we infer so much uh, about these objects and the cosmos uh, or the environment they, they, they reside in? Uh, it's essentially through the waveform as I hinted. So here, uh, if you can see my cursor, um, um, on the left, I show um, a schematic of two black holes with their own independent spins, um, uh, processing and then uh, coalescing uh, because of uh, loss of energy through gravitational wave emission. And as these uh, two black holes in spiral, um, and that then I transit to the right uh, plot here, um, they, they emit gravitational waves with the instantaneous frequency of this strain uh, shown um, as a time series uh, below the cartoon. Um, uh, the instantaneous frequency is uh, twice the orbital frequency. And the closer these two black holes come to each other, uh, the, we are digging deeper into the gravitational potential and the amplitude of the strain increases. Uh, and eventually they merge. And then um, the final object in this case will also be a black hole. And the black hole um, um, is uh, quite compact with a very strong surface gravity and it rings down like a damp sinusoid as shown in the last few cycles. Um, so these waveforms, the, one of the computational challenge, I mean, given the theme of this workshop is, is to produce these waveforms across a vast parameter space. Um, the inherent parameter space um, is of the order of um, uh, 10. But uh, the overall parameter space, um, um, uh, if you include uh, things like uh, you know, the sky location, the orbital inclination, et cetera, uh, would, be, would run over a dozen parameters. Um, so, but even if you limit yourself to the inherent parameters, such as the inherent spins of these objects, um, uh, and if their uh, orbits have any eccentricity, um, if for example, some of, uh, uh, if they have horizons or not, um, uh, those things um, are, um, are a challenge to uh, simulate because um, especially if you also allow for very disparate masses, because then you have to um, have your, uh, have adaptive groups where you can uh, uh, resolve the different objects um, as required by their inherent sizes and also track them as they come closer. I think some of these details you will hear um, a couple of talks later by Prayush. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that, um, but apart from modeling these waveforms, um, 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 we, um, the, the other complementary challenge is how do you then hunt for them in, in noisy data? So that is the signal search uh, problem. Uh, I'm going to say a few words about that uh, uh, um, 
a few slides later, but um, uh, persisting with the binary black hole waveforms, um, how do we model them? We use post Newtonian theory in the early part of the waveform then when the um, binary components are somewhat spaced out. So they're, um, they're not gravitationally interacting very strongly. Um, their speeds are much less than the speed of light. So we expect perturbation or, or rather expansion in, um, in powers of the velocity of these objects beyond um, the Newtonian orbits um, to be uh, quite reliable. But as they come, and in this part of the work um, was um, in India, if I uh, limit myself to Indian contributors, I mean, historically that has been led by uh, Bala Ir and his collaborators. Um, but as you come closer, um, you cannot ignore the effects of numerical relativity because like in the first uh, signal discovered uh, almost, well, a little over five years ago, but announced almost five years ago, that was 150914, um, that binary black hole merger um, had just a, a few cycles close to merger. And uh, to, to model them, you know, the velocities uh, were very close to the speed of light. I mean, almost like 40, 50% of the speed of light by the time those objects were merging. So there you cannot avoid um, invoking numerical relativity. So um, there um, in, in the past, uh, this effort was primarily led by uh, researchers outside India. But uh, lately, um, Indians have also been contributing to generating these waveforms. Um, in some parts of the binary black hole parameter space. And finally, there is the perturbative regime where once the two black holes have uh, coalesced, you, you have a perturbed black hole. And here, um, India uh, actually um, uh, showed the lead through the pioneering work of uh, Vishweshwara who passed away a couple of years ago. Um, and um, with the heaviest black hole merger that I'm talking about, we have actually seen um, um, just the you know, first uh, couple of cycles of this ring down waveform. So, um, so this, this waveform is now on firm footing observationally and is consistent with GR as you mentioned. Um, now, uh, but why is this waveform uh, an identity card? That is because um, a, this waveform will be modulated differently if for example, um, the two black holes were, with, were of very different masses or if they had spins or if, they had, if the orbit had eccentricity. But if you include matter effects, because black holes are vacuum solutions uh, of GR, but if you include matter effect, then also you will have uh, a, a dephasing. So um, it is therefore very important to track the phase of these waveforms. And after they merge, um, if they leave a ring down signal, as you sh um, saw in the previous slide, then you know it's a black hole. But if you have deviation from the ring down signal, uh, in the um, right extreme of, of this uh, wave train, um, then that can tell you a few different things. For example, maybe um, um, the, job, the object is not a uh, black hole. Um, it could be an exotic compact object, or it could be um, um, a hypermassive neutron star, uh, which before it collapses to a black hole, uh, it may have a, um, um, a bunch of um, post-merger oscillations, characteristic of the equation of state of, um, of that hypermassive neutron star. So a lot of physics can be unearthed uh, by tracking this phasing. Now, and that is why, again, it's very important that we obtain computationally accurate waveforms. So the, uh, so the grid has to be very fine to be able to track this phasing um, uh, with, with the uh, needed precision. Um, some examples of these waveforms, I mean, as opposed to uh, circular or quasi-circular orbits, if you actually had eccentric orbits for the two black holes, then you notice that the waveform will be quite deviant. Um, and, and this is physically understandable because for eccentric orbits, you have part of the time, um, you know, each black hole coming closer to, uh, the, to its very astron. And so the instantaneous frequencies uh, of the wave is expected to rise, but also the amplitude because um, this black hole is sampling a uh, uh, stronger uh, or deeper part of the gravitational potential. Um, so the exact tracking and actually tell you the eccentricity of the orbit. Um, you can have spinning processing binaries and there again, uh, you will have modulation introduced by the spins. Um, and lately, uh, uh, the community is realizing that there could be other ways of distorting the waveforms. Um, and here again, uh, multiple groups um, in India have um, contributed, including um, people at the ICTS and, and recently also at IUCA, uh, where here I'm showing how those in spiral waveforms I showed earlier from binary black holes can get distorted because of strong lensing 
or even a combination of strong lensing and, uh, uh, and a population of micro lenses. So, so these are the various reasons why uh, modeling these waveforms accurately is um, um, your first key to uh, unlocking um, uh, the very interesting physics these um, uh, coalescences may hide. Um, um, additionally, um, people, um, especially in Europe, are exploring the possibility that um, uh, apart from binary black holes and neutron stars, you could even have exotic compact objects where um, in this diagram I'm showing uh, the um, uh, potential of a black hole, in this case, a non-spinning black hole, um, uh, as a function of the tortoise coordinate here in units of the mass. Um, so in the top panel, you, you just see this potential as you expect, and then the tortoise coordinates of the light surface will be uh, in this location as, a, as, as shown here. But on the other hand, um, if this object is not a black hole, uh, but something very compact, nevertheless having a surface outside the horizon, or what would be the short shell radius, uh, so not a horizon, then um, you would have a surface as shown uh, at something like you know, minus, uh, at minus 5m. Uh, in, in the tortoise coordinate. So this surface will have some reflectivity and therefore can um, uh, cause um, uh, perturbative modes to be trapped in this well before they uh, um, are able to leak out. So in such a case, um, there will be again a change in the phasing of the waveforms produced uh, by uh, two such exotic compact objects. Um, this dephasing was, um, and by the way, uh, whether or not we are losing uh, energy into the horizon, or we have a situation where part of this energy uh, as shown in this crystal like diagram uh, that is getting reflected, right? That will affect what is being observed by gravitational detectors at uh, sky plus or this future null infinity. Um, and um, so this correlation that was conjectured before actually has been numerically established um, by a set of work as shown here. Um, uh, and I would like to shout out at Vaishak Prasad, who is a PhD student. Um, he also contributed to showing that uh, information falling towards the horizon is strongly correlated with information that is arriving at gravitational wave detectors. This is important because um, this way we can actually test general relativity by checking if information acquired at our detectors on Earth, um, for example, are correlated with the kick velocities um, that um, these um, compact objects receive at merger. Um, so um, in turn, uh, they can even establish that these compact objects are indeed black holes in general relativity and, and not something else. But the dephasing I talked about because of loss of energy um, uh, through uh, the horizon into the black hole um, can actually be tested. So here there are two waveforms. Um, this is another uh, study uh, by another PhD student, Shahid Dutta, um, who showed that if you um, have absorption um, so that's the blue trace here, uh, which is what we expect for a black hole horizon. Um, then the phasing is different from one where you have all other parameters the same, uh, but you don't have absorption, but you have perfect re reflectivity, uh, which again can be consistent with um, exotic objects such as gravis stars or boson stars that um, uh, some authors have proposed. Um, now, when you bring in matter effects, then I, in my opinion, things become even more interesting. And so here we um, saw a snapshot from a simulation by Baswan et al, uh, where there are two neutron stars and, and these contours can be thought of as uh, equipotential contours. These two neutron stars have not yet merged, um, but they are um, um, just you know, milliseconds away from merging. Uh, but you notice how tidally distorted these neutron stars are uh, even before merger. And this tidal distortion changes the time varying quadrupolar um, you know, moment that these objects have. And, and that is indeed the source of uh, gravitational waves. So you can expect again, a change in phase uh, because of this tidal distortion. Um, and this distortion has been used to um, um, constrain the equation of state of neutron stars. Uh, but how do you actually measure this distortion? I mean, the one challenge you have to beat before you get there is to uh, be able to, again, um, unravel this phasing very precisely. Um, what I show here is again, that first event from 2015, which was quite loud with an SNR of um, something like 24, 25 um, in Livingston and Hanford. And, um, but to be able to unearth this from um, noise, uh, there's uh, again, a lot of effort that is needed. And some of that effort has been led by people like Sanjeev Dharander and his collaborators. 
Um, and here I show um, that the, um, uh, the prototypical binary neutron star signal that we saw in 2017 was itself marred by a strong glitch. And to be able to um, characterize this as a glitch and then um, uh, regress it from data, uh, it still requires care because otherwise you're going to modify the signal uh, and introduce artificial um, 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 uh, residues. So you don't want to do that. Um, so some of these effort also has been contributed by people listed here. In fact, uh, Sanjit Mitra and his collaborators have recently shown how, uh, how to improve the significance of some of these signals by using machine learning, uh, where they actually teach uh, the machine how to recognize um, uh, noise artifacts from real signals. And that therefore um, uh, improves the significance of these signal tracks. Here, this chirp is a time frequency track that we expect from a binary uh, uh, compact object coalescence. Um, so you use the phasing of those coalescences then- to, yeah, You are almost near the time, so just maybe you can- uh, Okay, yeah. uh, just a minute or so. Um, so here uh, we show how for this binary neutron star, we were able to constrain the pressure in, in you know, neutron star matter as a function of density. Um, so the, the, and, and the left we show only the uh, pulsar um, um, uh, mass limit that is used to constrain things. Uh, in the bottom, we showed this in the form of mass radius diagrams. But if you use gravitational wave observation, how you notice how these posteriors, the 90% posterior shrink. And then to that, if you use the nicer mass radius observation, it shrinks things further. So it, it's a multi-messenger observation already that is helping us. You can also do um, consistency tests between what you see in the in-spiral phase and what you see in the ring down phase to check whether things are consistent with general relativity. And that work was led by another then uh, PhD student of Virup Ghosh at ICTS. Um, and this is important because there are uh, alternative theories of gravity that um, predict a different signal in, in, in the ring down shown in red here, such as from Brain World, as opposed to the damped sinusoid in GR shown in blue. Um, and okay, so what is the next discovery phase? I mean, we expect that eventually perhaps we'll see a stochastic uh, background of gravitational waves. Um, which could be, the distribution could be different here in the density parameter omega for binary neutron stars as opposed to binary black holes. And in the right, I show how these uh, uh, LIGO Virgo noise curves are gradually going to seep into probing um, uh, these distributions. We are not there yet because we are actually at this black line with the uh, latest concluded observation, the third observation one. Um, and then um, we can use these observations to constrain the rate of formation of black holes in redshift. Um, and then, okay, this is my uh, last slide. So in summary, what do we expect uh, in maybe the next 10 years? This is my you know, uh, list of uh, guesses. Um, I would say we would expect to see more oddball binaries, uh, maybe at least including one that um, uh, is discovered by uh, a machine learning algorithm. That has not happened yet. Uh, what I mentioned for the Sriji et al. study was one where the significance was improved for, for one pre-discovered object. Uh, we can get a more precise measurement of H0. I didn't talk about Hubble parameter because uh, it's, a, it's a short talk. If you have questions, I can uh, answer that there. I talked about effect of lensing. So we ex I would expect to see at least a lens binary that in turn can uh, enrich the physics we learned because through gravitational waves, you can measure, measure the time delays of the lens images. That in turn tells us things like, you know, how fast gravity can travel. Um, we, I expect to see a stochastic background of gravitational waves. Uh, of course, it needs um, improved detectors, but that is what we expect to happen in LIGO and Virgo in the coming years. Um, possibly a gravitar, which is a spinning wobbling pulsar emitting gravitational waves. Maybe a gravitational discovery by, by pulsar timing array. Um, maybe it's imminent, I don't know. And then maybe post merger signals of binary neutron stars, which could perhaps hide information about phase transition in nuclear matter. Uh, with that, let me end here and again remind people that uh, what I've shown here has benefited from um, uh, work from a lot of people, many young faces here. This, of course, is a pre-COVID picture, but when, uh, when um, things, when the pandemic you know, allows us, um, maybe we'll get a more uh, recent picture um, of the community. Thank you. Well, thank you, Shrikanta, for this very broad introduction and uh, setting the right pace for this session, actually, uh, from the physics point of view and the results that we can have and where numerical relativity more fits in, which allows us to have more technical discussions in the later half. So I'll open the floor for questions. Um, participants, if you have questions, please raise your hand. Shantanu Desai, I'm asking you to unmute yourself. 
Yes, so Sukandar, since you mentioned exotic objects, right? So one of the bastion of another kind of exotic object uh, is in India, Pankaj Joshi. So uh, on naked singularity. So maybe it's just my ignorance. Uh, can are the LIGO disorders? Can you rule rule out naked singularities? Uh, Sorry, this is a physics question, not uh, no, not in line with the theme of this talk. But since I was just curious. Um, okay, I'm. Um... I cannot give you a statistically uh, um, uh, informative answer on with what confidence we can rule it out. But what we have seen so far is um, consistent with uh, either binary black holes or binary neutron stars in general relativity. Uh, the one issue I have with naked singularities is that, uh, you know, how do you handle predictability at the singularity, right? So, uh, uh, but maybe that's a discussion for another day. But what we have seen so far um, can be um, explained very well with black holes and uh, neutron stars. Okay, thanks, Shantanu. The next question by Dibendu. Hi, Shukanto. So this is uh, Dibendu from Isaac Kolkata. I'm not an expert, but I'm just trying to understand this interesting uh, stuff that you mentioned about a stochastic background of gravitational waves. Uh, so do you mean a non non directional, like something not related to a particular event, but a general background of of volume filling gravitational waves, which is existing in the universe that you might be able to detect? Yeah, so um, uh, this um, is um, related to the fact that uh, we have been observing, you know, especially binary black holes deeper and deeper. And uh, as, our, as the detector sensitivity improves, um, uh, um, and given that we have actually observed some really loud ones from a uh, redshift, uh, a very high redshift, um, uh, and given the projections for the population um, through, through plots like this, where at, at close redshift, you know, the error bars are very small. Of course, at high redshift, we don't know. Things can be, the rates can be very low or very high. But, but even if they are uh, along this, uh, let's say, you know, the median line, then uh, we expect that there will be several, you know, uh, mergers happening um, um, uh, in a short enough time so that we will not be able to resolve the signals, meaning the signals will be overlapping. So we'll not be able to resolve the signals in time or in, 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 um, in, in the sky. Right. So, so that so that, that I think answers your question. So, so what we'll observe yeah. instead is, is as a background. So there will be a hum right. in the mm -hmm. and not. Uh, isolated. And will that tell you about the frequency of such events happening in the universe, perhaps? Yeah, um, but for that you will have to invoke a model for uh, a, right. you know. Of course, of course. Black holes, yeah, of course. Of the black holes. Uh, but indeed, um, uh, once you have a background, if you are able to measure this distribution uh, precisely enough. Uh, you can start constraining the, the formation rate and also the mass profiles mm -hmm. uh, of these black holes, the star formation right. rate and the mass. Profile. Great, very interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thanks, Dibyanda. Any other quick question? Uh, one last question? Well, maybe I'll, I'll just uh, I'll push in one, Shukanto. So you give a very nice uh, wide background of where all those uh, techniques in the physics stands. But especially coming from the numerical point of view, as you saw, as you said, you can use the post Newtonian stuff, but then beyond a certain point, you need to go to the actual relativistic simulations and those are costly. So in the community, uh, what is the bottleneck now? Do you need more simulations or you already have the simulations? You just don't know which simulations to pick from. No, um, <laughs> it will be good to, yeah. I mean, as we were uh, hearing in other discussions today. Um, uh, so I would say we know enough um, uh, techniques and uh, we have enough, um, methods that can give us precision, uh, uh, but the, uh, we, we need the uh, computing resources to deploy them on to cover um, the parameter space of the sources. Um, what I'm trying to say is that if you have a very lopsided mass distribution where a binary is, uh, you know, a binary component is, um, let's say of the order of 100 times more massive than the other one, right? Then uh, that push, uh, that uh, demands, um, again, resolutions of different kinds uh, to track these objects across the grid. Uh, and um, I think we have not been able to scan the full parameter space, partly because we, are, we don't have enough compute resources. I mean, this, this requires also uh, running these simulations for several months to be able to get precise enough waveforms uh, over several cycles. And we need several cycles because uh, NR is already relevant in those cycles before merger. Uh, if you're talking about uh, overtones, for example, uh, when this object is ringing down, there again, um, uh, we may need uh, both uh, some uh, developments in techniques where we have, for example, higher order um, horizon finders 
on one hand, but also um, uh, computational resources where we can uh, uh, model this in you know, the evolution of the overtones long enough uh, so that we have enough of a signal bandwidth to search in the data. Eventually, of course, the observations have to complement them by giving us enough signal to noise ratio in these objects. Okay. Pravish may actually gives um, uh, uh, maybe a um, complementary answer to what I just said. Okay, so uh, we'll hear from Pravish, uh, Pravish after this. So I uh, will uh, like to thank Shikanta once again for this nice overview. And then uh, move on to uh, Indranil next. So Indranil, I'll ask you to unmute yourself and then share your screen. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Shukanto. Uh, Indranil, can you hear me? You, you are a co-host. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, just a minute. Uh, I will just... Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm very sorry that uh, I, I missed most of the workshop. It's very interesting talks I missed. But anyway, uh, the internet connection is also very poor here. So, anyway, so I'll start. Uh, fresh results so uh, so it will be initial results all right so now accretion we know is the best model to explain the illuminosity etc uh, but we also know that accretion onto black hole is trans relativistic in nature that is at large distance the flow is non relativistic but close to the horizon the, if it is a black hole of course uh, flow is relativistic if it is jet, then it's the other way around. It should be uh, non-relativistic close to the black holes. The, uh, the bulk speed should be non-relativistic and at large distances, relativistic. Uh, so uh, from this accretion, accreting matter, a fraction of the matter is also supposed to be redirected as bipolar jets, say the flows around compact objects. So the important point to note is that jets are launched from accretion disk and uh, close to the uh, compact object. And the, there, the matter is quite hot. Therefore, the plasma around compact objects are fully ionized and thermally re relativistic, which means that the thermal energy is uh, roughly, if the gas part Particles are distributed in non-relativistic to relativistic speeds in the fluid rest frame, then the constant gamma equation of state is untenable. So in general, when we study numerically or otherwise, uh, gas flows around compact objects, then what we generally do is we use the relativistic equation of motion, but a uh, Newtonian kinetic theory, uh, I mean, uh, equation of state coming from e uh, Newtonian kinetic theory. Well, that means the gamma, constant gamma equation of state uh, can be computed and was computed by, uh, first by Chandrasekhar and then later by Singh Cox. Assuming it to be a Maxwellian distribution, but the energy Q being the uh, momenta of each particle, uh, but rather the, the relativistic version of energy. And if you do that, then uh, the equation of state, what we get, I mean, in, and integrate in the phase space, and then you calculate what is the energy per unit volume, then it turns out to be the combination of, of uh, modified Bessel's functions of various kinds. So uh, the problem with this was that because it is a modified Bessel's function, to implement in numerical simulation codes, it is the time taken increases. And now if you want to do more uh, you know, sophisticated physics, then it, it, is, it is what is called uh, computationally expensive. So what we did was, uh, many people also did try, okay. So uh, we did an algebraic uh, approximation of this equation of state by Chandrasekhar. We call it RP. RP means 
it is relativistically perfect. Uh, so we uh, extend it from single species to multi species. Uh, fluid because we propose it long, long back in 2009. Okay, there's something missing here, okay? I don't know what happened. Sorry. This is one If you want to add positrons, then positrons. Of course, the charge balance of this in terms of very simple form, rho f. f is a dimensionless parameter, uh, a variable. Uh, rho being the mass density given by this. And uh, f is this dimension variable. Theta is the pressure divided by the ma uh, rest mass energy density of the fluid. Tau is uh, 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 com composition parameter, is function of uh, so this is tau, basically. This is 2 minus xi by xi by eta. And xi is the proportion ratio of protons and electrons, eta being the ratio of electron mass by the proton rest mass. And uh, the polytropic index will come out to be this, which is basically uh, a derivative of, uh, of f with theta. And then the adiabatic index is 1 by n, uh, 1 plus 1 by n. And uh, then you can understand that both n and gamma is no more constant. But to be fair, we don't need these concepts of n and f at all. Uh, sorry, gamma and f at all, uh, gamma and n at all, because they are they don't enter the the, the equations anywhere. Every, everything is a function of theta there. So now if we plot the gamma. But since we are more adopted uh, with it varies from gamma four third to five, uh, four third to five third, and it also that is that is temperature dependence also depends on the uh, the composition of the flow. This is for the electron positron. This is for the electron proton. All right. So uh, now uh, so we have implemented. We may we 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 uh, build a relativistic core uh, some time ago. And uh, then uh, just recently, we also obtained the exact solutions of Riemann problem. Riemann problem is essentially people who work on numerical simulations knows is basically an evolution of initial discontinuity and want people to get exact solution and then match the codes with these uh, Riemann problem. So here is one example of Riemann problem is a uh, 1D version of a relativistic jet. So this is density, this is pressure, and this is the uh, forward velocity. Uh, so. So it's close to one. So I think 0.99 was the injection speed here. And it's for xi equals to one, that is electron proton flow. We can also do it for electron positron and so on. All right, so, but however, this was done before, but we will talk about something else today. So uh, one of the points that uh, the people who do numerical simulations, even around compact objects face, that flow around compact objects are hot. Generally, they are hot, but they are not always relativistic in terms of bulk speed. So, for example, Keplerian disk is always subrelativistic in bulk speed, and it is also subrelativistic in 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 uh, temperature as well. But even advective accretion flows achieves moderately moderately relativistic infall speed only at distances less than 2.5 Schwarzschild radius, okay? So then it, it achieves around 60% the speed of light. And then from 2.5 to one Schwarzschild radius, it, it, it achieves the speed of light. So, but that's a very short distance. But, and most of the radiations in physics that happens and that, that we detect is outside that, okay? Even jets are supposed to be relativistic in bulk speed for uh, distances greater than few into uh, hundred social radius. Uh, Presence factors, G mu nu's, and so therefore, to do a lot of physics, it is really uh, computationally expensive. 
So people who do GR image DE simulations, they, 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 can, they will vouch for. And so therefore, using uh, uh, computational uh, facilities judiciously, to do that, it is better to have some idea, okay, that what we are trying to search for. So these kind of codes, which is essentially non-relativistic, I mean, they use non-relativistic equations of motion, people use it. What we did is we use this non-relativistic equations of motion, but now we implemented the, this relativistic equation of state we proposed uh, some time back, okay? So that means that we start with these equations. This is very well known, uh, 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 fluid equations, and uh, where E is uh, E plus uh, rho UK squared by, 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 by two. So the kinetic energy plus the internal energy. Now we insert the, the, the CR equation of state here, okay? But of course, we have to recalculate the eigenstructure of the code and therefore the fluxes from there on and then the usual TVD routine. But well, I must, must say that it's nothing to do with TVD. We already, we are uh, developing a Vino code, which is, I mean, TVD is basically second order correct in, in space. A Vino code is, is, you can go up third order, fourth order, uh, fifth order, and so on. So we can go up. So we are already implementing it in a Vino code. So, uh, so it's, it, it is, it's independent of the numerical scheme you want to uh, use, okay? So now again, uh, we checked it with the initially, we developed a, uh, a Cartesian code, and then we checked with uh, shock tube tests, the Riemann, one of the fav I mean, uh, famous Riemann problem with the shock tube one. So uh, these are the parameters. So these are the left quantities, pressure, density, and uh, velocity, and these are on the right uh, side quantities, pressure. And the, the separation is at, at the middle, that is uh, here 0.5, and then we allow it to, uh, to, to evolve. And here is the velocity and this density pressure. And here you can see the gamma, how the gamma is very here. Okay, all right. So now then what we did, we converted the code from Cartesian to the spherical coordinates, still one dim dimensional because it's a, it's a work in progress. And we then use the patinsky vita potential to take care of the strong gravity. And uh, we here, uh, in this case, we are showing a simulation. This is a Mach number versus the distance. And we have injected from around 200 Schwarzschild radius. And we're injecting it. Uh, and uh, I, have, I'm not I have not shown here with the matching with the steady state uh, uh, analytical solution, but it matches pretty well. Okay, so this is a smooth accretion solution along the equatorial, uh, forget about the equatorial plane. So, I mean, it is a conical flow we can assume, but anyway along the radius. So here is a shock accretion solution, uh, again, with uh, the Bernoulli parameter this and lambda this, lambda is being the angular momentum. And uh, here you can see it's nicely, so this is the density, this is the Mach number, this is the uh, adiabatic index. So it, it is around little around 1.53 uh, at uh, I think 600 Schwarzschild radius. And again, this is electron proton flows, I guess equal to one. And it just goes then at, uh, near the horizon, it is 1.44, okay? All right, so here is the match with the analytical solution and the simulation, which is a pretty good match. Uh, you can see that the shock has been resolved in around five cells. Uh, 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 but again, uh, if we change with the same injection parameters, so these are the injection parameters, the V injection, the theta injection, the lambda injections, of course, 1.75. And, but we change the xi from one, which is electron proton, to xi equals to 0.25, which means that the proton fraction, the proton number density is about 25% of the electron number density. The rest are positrons. Then there's this shock, this accretion shock goes away. Okay, so this is what, what we can, uh, uh, this is what, what is the solution is. So it's indeed uh, uh, composition of, of uh, the accreting matter. Uh, affect the solutions fairly uh, significantly. All right, so now uh, if we increase, again, we go to electron proton flow, but if we increase the velocities, I mean, basically we change the outer boundary condition, then uh, you see it goes to the steady state first with the previous uh, injection parameters, 
and then we increase both the velocity and the temperature around after I think 40. You can see something here. Okay, so it, uh, it takes some time. Okay. Yes, now you can see that this perturbation going and the shock is washed out. Okay. All right. So, yeah. So uh, then uh, we uh, again check with uh, uh, radiatively driven winds. Uh, uh, so, uh, bipolar winds. So, something like this we have bipolar outflows here, and here is the Christian disk. The inner part is, is the compact corona. Okay, uh, forget about how you get this con uh, compact corona, and they give a lot of hard radiation from here. And uh, here, what we are doing, we are only studying the jet. With the jet, the disk is not coupled here, so they are not coupled because it's of course it's one-dimensional. We can't couple it in one dimension. And the outflow is along the equatorial plane. There is no rotation, only a radial outflow. But the radiation field from these uh, the accretion disk impinges. Now, because the jets are uh, are uh, optically thin, therefore the radiation field penetrates the jet. So therefore, as the jet moves, it also sees the, the radiation field uh, in front and it feels a pressure from that radiation field. Okay, and they depend on the velocity of the jet. I'm not showing the equations here. Uh, velocity of the jet as well as the energy density of the radiation field and the pressure of the radiation field. Okay, because it is one dimension, then we only have to calculate the pressure along the uh, uh, along the axis of symmetry and also the energy density across, uh, uh, across, uh, along the axis of symmetry. Okay, and the fluxes will will sort of push it up, and the radiation field in front, uh, I mean the energy density and the pressure in front will try to uh, pull it down. And the faster it moves, the faster that it will feel the drag. It's something like if you throw a uh, 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 you know. A stone in air, it feels the drag and so on. Okay. Now, if the disk is uh, is uh, the disk parameters are changed, the radiation field will change. However, the entire jet will not uh, know instantly the disk has changed because of the finite speed of light. Some some kind of a uh, in electrodynamics we did right. It's some kind of a uh, retarded potential kind of a thing. It's not a potential. It is a radiation field. But uh, it, it, since the, the light takes some time, so the, the light will affect it here uh, before then here. And so we study this effect in this particular study. So here what we have done, yeah, I'm always true. Uh, uh, here what we have done, we have changed, we have, we have said that this is the median, uh, uh, the ray, corona radius is around 10. The disk luminosity is one Eddington luminosity. The amplitude of the oscillation is 5RG. So the corona is going from 10 to 15 and then coming back to 5. And uh, the time period is around 0.1 uh, MB second. MB is the solar mass, uh, I mean, sorry, the black, uh, black hole mass or whatever, the compact object mass uh, in terms of uh, uh, solar mass. Okay, so now you, you can put whatever solar mass we want. Now the corona height maintains a ratio of 0.6 with excess. So whatever will be the excess, the corona height will reduce or increase and keep this ratio 0.6. So this is uh, what we have done. And we can see that the jet, you can, in, you can see somewhere here, there was a shock forming, okay? So what happens is, I'll, in the next slide I will just show. So these are, uh, we have done it for three cycles and then it's repeating, okay? So what we have want to show here is that this was the steady test solution here. Okay, and you can see the the energy density is this one, and the the pressure, the radiation pressure, and this is the uh, radiative radi radi flux. Okay, and uh, here it 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 sort of uh, it sort of um, uh, uh, decelerates because the radiation uh, energy density and the pressure is high here, but as it goes, I mean as it as, as uh, uh, the, the, the location of this uh, corona radius goes to seven from 10, then the proportionately 
the energy density and everything goes high okay and so therefore it dips further okay and if it is sufficiently you know tune it well then you can form a jet shock here you can see there is a jet shock forming and then the jet shock goes away okay it will be even you know more more significant if the corona height does not change much okay it doesn't maintain a ratio so then you can see a shock comes and again there is another shock forming and we have just uh, computed up to 1000 schwarzschild radius but you can see this is catching up so you can have colliding shocks okay if we simulate it further uh, in this so uh, in in all the cases we have we have only simulated electron proton outflows if we get electron uh, positron or uh, maybe uh, uh, some amount of positron then uh, it will be fairly good okay all right so i'll i'll just end, end it up here okay i think i've, I've, I've completed in time yes yes so uh, so thanks a lot for this wonderful talk actually and um, i'm not sure if well, many can appreciate how difficult it is to actually develop a riemann solver from scratch so uh, great talk